I am. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call our committee of the whole meeting to order. Uh, we are going to commissioners. A couple things about today. Um, we're going to start off start off today uh, with just a few words about uh, recognizing one of our own who just recently yeah, received an award. Um, and then we have a number of action items. We have three updates that we're going to discuss here at Cow. We have public safety at 11 a.m. and then we have our work session from 1 to 4 with lunch at noon. Depending on time, um, hopefully I'll be able to move us along. Um, I'd really love to go into executive session for about 10 minutes to talk about a potential legal issue. Uh, so we'll I'll gauge time wise, but hope I don't want I want to be really respectful of public safety. Uh, and so if we can fit that in before public safety, then I'd like to. But I'll I'll just kind of keep my eye on the time and we'll see if we can fit that in. So with that, let's get started today. And first on our list this morning, I would like to call up our very own treasurer, John Globinski, um, who was recently honored uh, as the winner of this year's Prime Award by the Michigan Municipal Treasurers Association. Um, so John, we just want to take a moment to, uh, yes, we can all clap. Um, so we want to publicly, officially congratulate you. I know this is a really significant honor. Uh, so if you want to just say a few words about this award, and uh, maybe we can get a picture of you. I don't know if uh, we have anyone that has a camera, but we can well, get a picture of you. Uh, that would be great. Actually, I'd like to introduce Barb Fandel, who will, who's got some words. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you for having us. I am Barb Vandell. I'm the president of the Michigan Municipal Treasurers Association and a past prime winner myself. With me today is last year's past prime, Cheryl Ryan O'Neill from Oregon Township. Cheryl's also a former president for the MMTA and Lori Sheldon from the city of Kentwood, who's our membership director for the MMTA. Nice. Um, nice to have you all here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to join us. Thank you. You're welcome. So a little bit of our PRIME Award. PRIME stands for Professional Recognition and Municipal Excellence. It's a, the highest, pre most prestigious award that our association gives. Uh, it's given annually to recognize an individual member for outstanding service in his or her profession, community, and the association. So we look beyond what they do for our association. And it's selected by the peers of the MMTA. And we have over 900 members in our group. So it goes through a nomination process, and I have a few words that were written for John in his nomination. And one is, John's willingness to always share knowledge and information with other Treasury professionals helps solidify his selection in the prime recipient this year. And another member commented that John's dedication to supporting the continued growth and development of the city of Grand Rapids, as well as the MMTA, is evidenced through his professional and personal achievements. John helps educate and train and does a lot for the MMTA and the APT USNC. You are very lucky to have him. You have a former Al Mooney also receive this award. So for John to get it in his early in his career should tell you volumes of what you have built here at the city. Yeah. Thank so you. So we have the award. I'd like to present to John. You can come on this side and left handed. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I can officially hang it now. <laughs> That's Thank right. You. John, you want to say a few words? Um, first of all, to, this, to, to Mayor and Commissioners and uh, Eric DeLong, um, thank you for supporting our training initiatives. This couldn't uh, be possible without your support for our continuing education and training and building the skills that we need to be the outstanding city that we are. I started with the MMTA uh, professional training in 2011 and completed the, the basic training in 2013 and since then I've been doing advanced training and it's kind of blossomed into also giving uh, presentations at the organization and other organizations including the uh, MGFOA and the GFOA, the National Conference, uh, as well as the APT USNC. So this actually is, is a something that, that validates not only my training but able to then share that training with other uh, Treasury professionals. and. You know, right now we have three individuals in our office who will be finishing their basic this year. That's a three-year program, a new person who's starting. And so this provides 
by far the best in value in training for treasury professionals in the state of Michigan. And it's, it's basically each year is cheaper than a, a class at GRCC. So for us, it's, it's value added with the city. It provides excellent depth on my team and also for succession planning and making sure that we're all on the same page. And it really allows us to challenge each other with ideas and thoughts and uh, about, related to Treasury. And, it, and it, you know, great, it's cash coming in, but there's a lot more that goes into it when we talk about laws and how it's going to impact our citizens and how we can actually be a better department and support the initiatives of the city. So for that, I... I Thank Barb, Cheryl, and Lori for being here, and I, I look forward to continuing a, a long tenure with this organization and the MMTA and working to uh, really further the advancement of all Treasury professionals. So thank you very much. Congratulations, John. Thank you, and thank you for your service, and thank you, actually, all of you for your service. Appreciate it. All right, commissioners, let's move on then to our agenda. First resolution before us today is a resolution approving the request from Soho Sushi to obtain an outdoor service permit for 58 Monroe Center. So moved. Support. Support. All right. This is pretty straightforward, but do you want to add anything? Good morning. Good morning. All right, so this one's a little different. Soho Sushi um, submitted a request for local government approval to obtain an outdoor service permit for 58 Monroe Center. Uh, the zoning department has confirmed that the restaurant has legal non-conforming rights to operate outdoor cafe with alcohol service <coughs> subject to their annual encroachment permit. So it is being recommended for approval. Great. All right, Commissioner, any uh, questions about that? We all love to be outside in the summer, so we uh, and we want our sidewalks full of people. So, yeah. all right, sushi. and sushi. <laughs> yeah. We have fans of sushi. Yes. So, all right. So with that, uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right. Next, that will take us to a resolution approving the request from Forty Acres Lifestyle LLC for a redevelopment liquor license to be located at one zero five nine Wealthy Street Southeast. So moved. Four. All right, again, I think we're all familiar with this project, uh, but anything to add? Uh, the application was submitted on September 19th um, for 40 Acres Lifestyles for a redevelopment liquor license, again to be issued at 1040, 1059 Wealthy Street Southeast. Um, the Uptown Corridor Improvement District Board did approve the application at their meeting on November 1st, 2017, so the application is being approved um, and recommended for approval. All right, great. Commissioners, any questions, comments? All right, call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right, next that will take us to a resolution setting the date to consider amending the Heartside Historic District Statement of Significance and Period of Significance. So moved. Support. All right, so who is here to talk to us about that, Rhonda? So this was a, a lengthy report, uh, commissioners. That was in your packet. Um, really well done, I would say. It's very informative. So, <laughs> Ronnie, want to tell us about this? Well, this is a project that actually started in 2016 when we applied for a um, state grant for $21,000 to help us fund this overall project. We also got ten grand from the DDA to make this project completely feasible. <clears throat> what it's doing is essentially bringing the 1979 study report for Hartside up to date. We're looking into that 1929 to 1970 era and researching it based on the federal criteria to determine if any of those decades contribute to the overall history story and continued story of that district. And essentially just really, it's 40 years old. It needed a revamp. We've added to that district four times since 79, so there are four different reports for each time they extended it, and none of them really worked well with each other. They were all done at different times by different people and in different ways mm -hmm. <laughs> with different goals. So it was really just trying to clean it up. Uh, the end goal is to take this product and take it to the national level so we can quantify the national designation so it lines up with the local so our developers aren't getting confused, aren't getting bounced back because they're on the other side of the street. It's just been a mess over the last few years because they didn't extend the national boundary at the same time they did the local. So what you have before you is the outcome of that. It's a study report where they looked at those eras and that would essentially be added to the history from 1860 to 1929. They looked at all of the buildings built between 29 and 1970 and assessed all of them, again using the federal criteria. Um, what eventually came out of it was 
basically five buildings that may have the potential for a change in their review process out of about 375. And that is only because those buildings were built after 1929. So we have a couple from the 50s, one from 29, um, none of which actually ended up with a determination that's different from what the way they're already being treated. Um, this example is the JA building at the corner of uh, Fulton and Division. It would have been non-contributing in 1999 when it was added to the district because it wasn't 50 years old. But over time, the way the local board and the state have been addressing these old surveys is to reassess these buildings as they come up over time. And this one was actually deemed contributing. It got federal tax credits and state tax credits at the time for its rehab, <coughs> which it could not have gotten it if it was deemed non-contributing. So there really isn't anything that came out of this that is any different from what we've already been doing, it's just making it cleaner. Yeah. Great. All right, so commissioners, any, any questions about this? So this sets the public hearing for December 12th, um, and then it would be back before us after that. So any questions or comments? Just, just a note of appreciation once again for Past Perfect, Jennifer Metz and Rebecca Smith Hoffman and all the others, including you, Rhonda, who worked on this to, to clean it up. And clearly we're seeing the results. I mean, if you look down that corridor, starting with where Tower Pinkster is, it's just amazing that we preserve those buildings and they, they really, really add to the character of that neighborhood. It's very beautiful. Thank, Thank you for you. your work. Yeah, they did a wonderful, wonderful job. Yes, they did. Really complicated project. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. <clears throat> All right. Next, that will take us <clears throat> to a resolution approving a brownfield plan amendment filed by Jackson Entertainment LLC for a project proposed at parking area five and a portion of parking area four. Can I get a motion? So moved. Four. All right, Kara Wood, you want to talk to us about this? I know we're pretty familiar with this. It's sure. been a long time in the works. So you held a public hearing at your last meeting and took public <coughs> comment. This is a request from Jackson Entertainment <laughs> to request Brownfield Redevelopment Authority tax increment finance reimbursement up to <coughs> over $29 million over 30 years. And this would be um, an estimated $19.2 million to Jackson Entertainment and then a $1.7 million to the city for Ottawa Avenue relocation costs. The total project costs are estimated at over $110 million with 500 new full and part-time jobs and uh, a little over 100 new residential units included as part of the project along with the um, office building and a hotel and also the theater project itself. So probably a, a few um, important pieces of this to point out uh, that I know between the DDA and the, and the city uh, worked really hard in, in working through this um, process, but I think a, a few things that are important to point out on the second page of the resolution <clears throat> is that um, there has been conversations about having incubator space for minority and women-owned businesses. Yes. Um, that this will, <clears throat> the city will lease 300 parking spaces um, that will be publicly available. Uh, and we all know that parking is a significant issue, especially in downtown. Uh, and then also the, the Piazza area will be public, uh, but maintained privately, but will be available for public events um, and will actually be programmed. So that too is gonna be a partnership between the city and the DDA and um, and the and the project yep. developer or Lokes, I should say. Exactly. Commissioners, any any questions or comments? Commissioner. <clears throat> yeah, Mary, I'll just say again, as you pointed out, thanks for the work that everybody put in. It's been a long time, long time coming. So, Kara, thank you for you and your team and. Uh, <clears throat> To on this, the ability to use uh, tax credits to help put a parking ramp there does allow the, the parking system to preserve uh, the capital it needs to maybe look at an another project as well too. So I just wanted to point that out, and because I know that was a main concern for everybody on that site, you know, given given what's there now and kind of the pressure in that area. So I want to just thank everybody and look forward to seeing this get built. Mm -hmm. And as we heard at the public hearing, they're looking at closer to 900 parking spaces for yes. this site. So mm -hmm. in the memo, it's 750 to 900, but um, they're looking at that higher end of 900. That's great. Any other questions or comments? 
Um, I just like to say that I know this project has been in the works for a long time, um, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that there is some. There are going to be 440 new jobs added. That's important. That we'll have that um, component to of incub incubator space, and that although it doesn't get to um, you know the numbers that we like with some affordable housing, it certainly has a range of housing prices in that in that middle area, which which is good because we we're looking at that. And I know that already we have. Um, reached our goal for the 30% downtown in terms of affordable housing. So, so this is good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, next that will take us to, we, so commissioners, that's, the, that's what we have before us to vote on. Um, our next three items, and you know, I, I'm gonna move this around a little bit. Uh, because last, last week I bumped an update from our, from our city attorney. So I'm gonna actually have our city attorney go first and provide an update on the police and community relations work with 21st Century. I'm gonna get it started. Mayor. Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to the city manager and city attorney to give that update because I know that that's a brief update, and then we'll go back up and um, I'll go to the street lighting investment strategy update, and then after that is uh, information and an update and a discussion on the packaged alcohol sales that we discussed last week, or at our last meeting, I should say, two weeks ago. All right, is that okay, city attorney, city manager? Okay. We, I don't want you to get bumped it. again. <laughs> I know. So, all right. So, uh, I'll turn to both of you for the update. I believe our presentation or update will be very brief this morning, um, but that should not reflect uh, a lack of activity that's happening. Uh, you're going to hear a few things in just a moment, but specifically regarding the initiative that the city commission approved and and funded uh, to create a Know Your Rights campaign, I'd like you to know that. Uh, I've met with the consultant twice now, including uh, with Commissioner Lanier. Um, we uh, shared the overall objectives of the project, and uh, the consultant came back with uh, some mock-ups of things that uh, we, we might consider, and we have sent the consultant back to do more work. And so that work continues, um, and I think we're making good progress. But also, uh, we have come to understand that this work is really tied to what might be some of the recommendations coming out of the 21st century policing, police uh, policy and procedure review task force. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, at any rate, I made up that name, so yeah. Uh, Pretty, Pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> at any rate, um, we believe that there'll be some recommendations coming out from that committee and that work that may affect the Know Your Rights campaign, so we're, we're going to go slow just a wee bit to see if we can have that catch up, and then we'll re-engage our, our consultant to finish up the product. But I think all in all, it's going well. Great. I, you know, before uh, Anita, our city attorney, speaks, Commissioner Linear, you want to add anything to no, that? No, I think, I think um, okay. Greg covered it. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you, and thank you for your work on this. Commissioner. City attorney? Thank you. Um, just as a refresher, as part of the traffic study results and recommendations, um, the city took on the task of forming a task force group to review Grand Rapids Police Department's policies and procedures for any intended or unintended biases. So a, task, a diverse task force group was established consisting of 14 people. Seven people represent each of the wards and then seven people are different um, levels of command of the police department. They had their first meeting on September 27th and at that meeting they established their meeting dates, times, and what they thought that they would need to complete this body of work. We had a second meeting on November 1st, which at that meeting, they did three things. They reviewed the current activities of the Grand Rapids Police Department in relations to the recommendations of the 21st Century <coughs> Task Force as part of a baseline, to establish a baseline um, of GRPD's actions to address disparities in policing. Second, they discussed and identified topics and gaps to be addressed by the task force group. So they have a nice long list that they prioritize on where they're going to begin their work, and I'll allow them to share that with you, which they will do at their next meeting, which will be an open meeting. 
Third, they prepared for their public meeting, which is going to be December 6th, and we've um, publicized that. We've sent out invitations. Uh, we um, will also have media um, alerts that will um, inform people of that. Flyers have been made. We're getting those out, and so it's an open invitation for the public. Um, 21st Century Policing, that we refer to as 21CP, the organization the city hired to facilitate the process and the same policing experts that conducted the presidential task force group for the President Obama is um, providing the task force group with best practices in policing and materials to assist them in succeeding in this process. On both dates, 21CP began its assessment of the Grand Rapids Police Department at which time they met with top management staff, they toured the police department, and rode along with the officers throughout our city. On our third meeting will be on December 6th at 7 o'clock. The task force group, group will conduct its first open meeting at the Gerald R. Ford Academic Center, which is located at 851 Madison Southeast. The purpose of the meeting is to maintain an open dialogue with the community, keep the community informed and engaged in the process. At that time, they will introduce themselves, the facilitator, as well as Ron Davis, who's a 21st century um, principal. They'll give an update of their status. They'll share how all of this is going to work, how it's, um, the task force group is going to function, and they'll share with the community um, that they've heard their concerns and ask for any additional input from the community. Lastly, because you said this would be brief. No, yeah. that's okay, this is important. Lastly, um, the task force group desires for everyone to keep in mind that this is an action-oriented task force group, meaning that they will identify issues, they'll make immediate recommendations with the intent that immediate change will take place where possible, meaning that we won't um, go through the process, have at the end of it 101 recommendations at the end and hope that um, GRPD adopts those recommendations. Instead, what it will look like is quarterly, they will report out what they're working on, they will make those recommendations um, measured against 21 first century um, provision of best practices throughout the country. At that time, it's expected that GRPD will where possible, adopt those recommendations, or if not, um, establish reasons why. For instance, if, if you say community the re policing requires more, um, more police, then that's not something that we can do immediately. That will, you know, that's a change that would happen over a course of time. Um, lastly, I have to say, it's been extremely exciting watching the commitment of the members and their open and honest and respectful discussions in this process. We're excited about the possible, out the positive outcomes that will be generated in this process as a work towards um, improving police and community relations. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll turn to my colleagues for any questions. I know we've received regular updates, uh, and I know all of us know members who are sitting around the table, uh, both from the police department and from the community who are working on the task force and giving other time, which we appreciate. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, most of us can attend the community meeting on the 6th, uh, and we'll be able to hear directly from the task force and 21st Century Policing an update, uh, as well as follow up and answer anyone's questions who are, you know, who are who's attending that may have questions. So any any questions for our city attorney? All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's going to take us back up to talk about street lighting, which we've talked about around this table, I think, four times now. <laughs> um, so we'll, uh, over the last seven years, I think. Yes. So uh, city manager, you want to tee us up for this? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, today, this is the first of... Uh, a few topics that staff has been working on in anticipation of your upcoming budget year. Um, staff has, uh, as you know, for the last eight years been very focused on asset management and sustainable management of our assets and our operations. The city has done significant work with asset classes in the water department in uh, our uh, 
environmental services department, streets, parks, sidewalks, you know that there have been significant efforts made by uh, the city and significant investments made by the city commission to try to um, ensure that we sustainably manage our assets. So today we're going to be bringing forward to you a couple of additional asset classes that we currently do not have asset management plans set up for. They are currently not being sustainably managed. And um, so we're bringing forward to you plans on how that could be accomplished. We are not making a recommendation for implementation. We are not making a request for funding. We are simply showing you that um, there are some asset classes that have yet to be attended to. And uh, if it is your priority through your budget discussions to prioritize asset management for these asset classes, then this is how we would recommend it be done. So with that, the first one will be our street lighting system. As the mayor said, we've been talking about it for a long time, but the conversation is a little bit different this morning in that we have learned a lot since the last time we have spoken with you. So with that, Tom. Thank you, Greg. And I'm going to make just a few remarks, and then Chris will walk us through the A3, and Molly will uh, kind of go over the financial option, one of the way of financing um, um, the A3 that we have put together so we can invest in this system. And uh, to Greg's comment, uh, as part of the transformation plan, phase two was about investing in all of our assets. This is one of those that we identified that we needed to make an investment. The A3 is actually indicating um, the condition of our distribution system. So think of the engine of the car as the distribution system. The lights are just the lights on the car. Okay, So this is more about the distribution system than, than LED lights. Although we are recommending that if we are going to invest in, the, in replacing the distribution system, which we are recommending, uh, that you also invest in LED lights because there are savings that can come through that. Okay. Um, we also um, want you to look at the A3 as a way of managing risk. Um, you know, I can't stand here and say that the distribution system is going to last another day or two or a year or five. It might be another 20 year. But we do know that the condition of that system is such that we cannot depend on that system. And that's the system that we use when we buy the energy from consumer to power the, the lighting system, the traffic signal, parking, water. Uh, there are a number of departments that depend on that system to, to take the energy from consumer to, to them. So with that said, um, Chris is going to walk us through the A3. The A3, just so you know, is based on uh, we identify four levels of service. Um, the A3 is going to indicate that our distribution system is at a level D, uh, and we're going to explain what that means. And the um, funding strategy is based on a number of assumptions that we identified. To Greg's comments, um, this is just one way of addressing the issue. The issue is not going to go away, which is we have to make an investment in the distribution system that we have because it's beyond the life expectancy. Uh, how we finance that is a completely different conversation. Uh, we can use bond for the distribution system, and then we can use other financing for the LED lights because there's actually savings that can come back. We are estimating in the tune of $600,000 if we replace a the, the lighting, street lighting system we per have. Per year. Per year. Right. So how we finance the LED lighting, there are different models out there, but the distribution system is one that we have to invest out of our, we have to make that investment because there are no savings in, in, in upgrading that system, uh, which is one that we, that we own. So with that said, Chris. All right, thank you, Tom. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you once again about street lighting, something that I've become very, very passionate about. Um, I want to go back uh, just a little bit in time to Art Prize, where we had a busy Sunday afternoon. And what would the world look like without our distribution system and our street lighting system? Well, we had that happen. Our substation went down, and we had a very hot, very busy, very chaotic afternoon. So uh, remember how valuable the street lighting system is uh, for the city of Grand Rapids and the quality of life for all of our citizens. Back in 2010, we started down this journey. We've been talking about street lighting for some time. It's an asset that has been undervalued, undermanaged for too long. 
We're here today to talk to you about an investment strategy to move us towards the next generation of street lighting. LED fixtures are a part of that future. We began evaluating those back in 2010 as well. Energy savings was, was all the rage. And back in 2010, the technology wasn't capable of providing the outcomes that we needed today. We were also not well enough positioned to move forward with such an investment. Since then, we've made significant strides. In 2012, we did a system-wide audit with Siemens to take care of all of our above-ground assets into an asset registry that we now interact with on a daily basis with our CityWorks uh, work order tools. Moving forward from there, uh, we continue to evaluate LED. 2015, it finally works. We've put a fixture out in the field, recognize that it meets the requirements, and the technology has gotten there. We continue to evaluate our assets and we upgraded our, our, our system to include all of the underground assets, all of our manholes and vaults uh, and conductors underground. <clears throat> In 2016, we developed standards for the implementation of LED and uh, technology for our system. And Consumers Energy has been a wonderful partner all the way along. And so we, here we are today talking about the future investment in street lighting. To get to where we are for this discussion, there was a lot of work done for the A3 development. Uh, Tom, with Tom Almonte's leadership as, as well as Eric and Greg, we've put together a great team looking at all the efforts needed to develop the A3 before you today. Top management, fiscal services, street lighting, uh, consumers energy, geotech, and very specifically, I'd like to, to note Sean Moeller. Uh, traffic safety's lean savant, if you will, Sean, raise your hand, um, has been a very strong leader. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we thank him for his work on this project. I would describe our current level of service as break fix. So similar to maybe how we talked about roads previously, this is level of service D. We respond to emergencies as they happen. We have no preventative maintenance plan. We have no proactive uh, maintenance. We're describing different investment levels going all the way up to A. So level of service C, the next step up, we need to invest in critical safety improvements. We have parts of our system that are dangerous, that need to be addressed. And this is the minimum investment level for us to move forward. Going up one step higher, we can start thinking about asset management, system conversion, LED implementation, and investment level that would support proactive maintenance. And then there's the level of service A, which would be the dream scenario for me, where we're investing on a cyclical basis uh, for all of the system's needs, but is relatively unaffordable. So here is some of the numbers about our system. We use CityWorks very specifically to track and monitor our work. We have over four million feet of conductors that we maintain. We've got over 17,000 street lights that we're servicing each and every day. Uh, recall back um, last summer, we had a challenge in servicing our street lights in particular. We were up to six weeks uh, related to outages. We've been able to pull that back down to 10 days and have been sustaining that level <laughs> consistently. So some of our targets, we're suggesting an investment level that moves from uh, the break-fix scenario to the proactive uh, scenario level service B. Um, this identifies uh, opportunities for something that you might not specifically associate with street lighting. These improvements have the opportunity to provide a quality of life and racial equity component for our entire community. By going through a systematic deployment of lighting levels, we're able to provide a high quality of life on every street and every street light for every citizen in our great city. So I'd like you to consider that as a part of our implementation strategy. So I draw your attention to the graph. So if we do nothing, our assets are gonna to continue to deteriorate and we're looking at a very bleak future. If we do- That would be the yellow portion of the chart. Correct, yep, the, the forward line. Uh, moving to the gray line, you would see that we would be able to take care of our critical assets, but again, would continue down this path without sustainable asset management. Moving up to the orange 
is the investment level that is being suggested, where we're able to sustain our asset management over time in a very high quality way. And then a level of service A, uh, which would be the pristine scenario. So let me draw a parallel for you. Recall when we uh, made decisions about the street uh, income tax and that uh, entire uh, asset management plan, we set a goal to make 70% of our streets good and fair. Now we could have set a goal for 100%. That is, anytime a pothole shows up, it's immediately addressed and street conditions are always ideal. But that's, as Chris pointed out with this, probably not a state we can afford. A state that we could afford for streets we thought was reasonable is 70%. You can see by this chart, um, it's, it's some number less than 100%, I don't know, it looks like 80% or something, is the general condition of streets so that there will continually be an overturn of our asset management for our network and it will be at a rate that we think we can afford. Um, Chris, can I ask you a question? Um, can I ask you a question? So what we're looking at right here, so out of the 17,000 streetlights we have, last year we had over 3,000 of them that um, we had outages that we had to replace and, and go and maintain. Is yes, that correct? Um, and then when you referred to the earlier the um, potential $600,000 in savings by converting to LED, um, does that also take into account the reduction in operations if we have fewer streetlights that, because I'm assuming if we move forward, we're not going to have 3,000 outages to respond to a year. That's exactly correct. And but we're going to be more efficient with our system. Um, so so ROI includes yeah. um, re reduction in Materials. energy savings. Not only that. Um, and operations. Think of our water system. Okay, <clears throat> We have one person. Uh, using SCADA, the SCADA system, from one room monitoring the entire system. Currently, what we have is people driving around to find if a light is out or it's not. Mm -hmm. This will include a similar system where one, per one person can actually monitor the entire system. Mm -hmm. And when the light is out, then they know it's out and they can go and replace it. To, to your point, I think there will be potentially other savings because of, of how we are changing how the entire operation will be performing because of this. Mm -hmm. So I guess my ultimate question question was, is the <clears throat> potential $600,000 savings per year, is that a conservative number? Yes? Okay. That, that was my question. Yeah, that's at least 400000 in yes. energy savings um, and then material and labor on top of that. Uh, so it is more conservative. Okay. Thank you. Right. I, I have a question too. Go ahead. Yes, so similar to the vital streets that the manager just talked about, the industry best practice was where we landed, 70% good. And is that's this, precisely what this is. This is well. also industry, industry best, best practice. Industry best practice. Yeah. Well, and it seems to me with this, little, this margin not to go to level A but to stay at level B, offer some opportunity for innovation too as things come online? Absolutely. And so the proposal here is to fund um, a system for street lighting that has the remote monitoring, just like Tom was talking about, which effect effectively provides a platform for future opportunities. Um, and with that, we could look at additional technologies, uh, smart city resources, uh, and other options to advance our community. And I'd just like to add to that because I think that that's excellent. I'm, I'm thinking about you know being able to identify your parking spot, for example. But here again is where a public safety committee can come in to just assure our public that there is oversight in terms of these new technologies, and people don't feel like you know it's Big Brother. We will, we've drawn a very um, clear boundary with that. We get input from the ACLU. I think that's just an important thing that we've also but built in. Be clear. Today, staff is not making any recommendations. Absolutely, yeah. yes. But there are all kinds of options that are available to you under the category of smart city. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we step into the 21st century with a new street lighting system, then you would have those options. As a matter of fact, I was just going to say this investment, uh, that will be a completely different conversation at a later time. Okay. This is just to get the distribution system, the, the framework, back to life so then we can have those conversations. Right now, yeah. we, we can't even participate because nope. we don't have the infrastructure. Uh, uh, to be honest, Mayor, uh, Commissioner, I, I can't. It could be tomorrow, it could be in a week, it could be in a year. But the condition of the system is this is it's just not it's not in it. You are correct, shape. Mayor. We cannot have the okay. conversation about these new technologies today. Because we don't have the infrastructure. Right. Right, Mr. Yeah, I know that you might get to this in, in the next 
slide or two, but you know, walk me through. I know you mentioned that we've learned a lot. You know, we looked at what was eight million to ten million. Now it's twenty million. To kind of talk through what that twenty million is and what that kind of change is overall, I think is is one of the thoughts that's going through my mind when I'm seeing where we're at. I, I see where you can aggregate it and put it into levels of service, but if we can kind of unwind that twenty million spend, that would be that'd be key for me to understand. In the first bank commission, what we do is we do it in two conversations. One is the distribution system okay. and what percentage of the 20 is, because that's the, the majority of the investment, and then the LED lights, so you can understand the two. That would be helpful. I actually asked the exact same question, Commissioner. Um, and my understanding is the LED lights actually is still consistent with the numbers we received several years ago, but once the analysis of the distribution center was done, um, the, the hardwire and the poles, the significant <coughs> cost that we're hearing about today is largely in the system itself and not actually the lights. Okay. But I'll let, we'll, we'll walk through that just so we all have a really good understanding of that. Before we flip the page, is there anything else you need to say on this side, Chris? No. Okay. So then your question is perfectly timed, Commissioner. So unraveling the 20 million, what are the, some of the proposed countermeasures? And you're going to see the next slide with the funding scenarios um, in, a, in a conversation uh, with Molly about that in just a moment. We've been providing you information about investing in LED in several different levels. So it's base LED, LED plus technology, and LED plus the highest level of technology. And that's where you've seen those $8 million, $10 million, $13 million investment levels. But if we're to go out and just do LED, we're going to still have a system that has faults, failures, and challenges with its current asset conditions. And so to address the entire system and its assets, we looked at life cycle replacement costs. And that's where you get that level of service A that's described. So if we're to replace everything based on its life cycle replacement, let's say 40 years for a pole, 100 years for conduit, that would be the investment level of A. So once it reaches 40 years, pull the pole out, put a new pole in. What we're recommending is a replacement strategy that's based around conditional assessment and asset management. So the industry standard is, is to go out and do density testing on the poles and observe the physical condition of our assets and then replace the ones that are in poor condition. And so through that cyclical process of investing in not every asset, but rather the ones that are failing, is the level of service B that's being recommended. And that's why we go from 8 million just for LED up to 20 million for, for asset management of our whole system, which has an ongoing cost um, that's a greater investment than what we're currently making. It also provides us opportunities to invest in other projects. So when a street is being torn open, let's take care of all the utilities at the same time. Street lighting has been having trouble participating in those projects. Now we're gonna be able to participate in the reconstruction of streets, providing duct bank, um, conduit, new pole bases and pole replacement as a part of our process as well. And so that's how it grows from the LED investment Chris, to the comprehensive asset. Just for asset the sake of, because I think it's known information in, in our case, but for the mayor and the commissioner, when we talk about the distribution system, can you walk him through, we currently have two systems in place. Um, so what is the, the investment in the distribution system so they can understand that? So street lighting um, is a large network, um, similar, to, similar to your circulatory system in your body. And so as the trunks get smaller and branch out, we change from the primary distribution system down to the secondary distribution system, right? So the, the voltages uh, and wattages change uh, as you get further from the source. Um, so our primary sy distribution system is the one that pushes the power throughout the entire area. Then the secondary system is the one that delivers it to the street light right outside of your home. And so making investments in both the primary system so that we're able to continue to provide consistent, reliable uh, power to keeping the light on in front of your house are the investments that are described as part of the asset management strategy. And Chris, we have a breakdown of costs from uh, the conduit <coughs> and the underground work with the utilities versus the base of the poles and the cost of new poles. Is that all broken down? 
Correct. With the asset registry, we know exactly how many of everything that we have and the typical construction cost to re re replace each and every one of those. And that's what was built into the projections. And does that include historic lighting as well? It does. It, it talks about replacing the existing historic lighting with uh, in-kind, but adding new decorative lighting is a cost that's beyond the projection. So this is to replace in-kind the existing system. So for historic lighting, the pole would stay if it's a relatively new, like I'm thinking of all the new poles that went up in Uptown, on Fulton, on Cherry. My guess is that those are still, Ottawa Hills, those would still be in Absolutely. good shape. It would just be the changing out of the lights to an They'd be retrofitted. Retrofitted, okay. Exactly, correct. Okay. That pole will be replaced 40 some years from now when it's at end of life. Okay, so can we go to the back? Right. Yeah, can we can we just stop there for a minute though? Because I I think sorry you're just about to get out, but um, when we when we went through was that then a crisp part of the audit? Because I thought the audit was more about um, where light was and where where poles were, meaning like is, is there is there some level of um, independent study on the distribution system? Because if I'm reading it, if I'm just doing the quick math, I mean that's that's twelve twelve million dollars of the spend. You're correct. So with the asset registry that was created with the Siemens yep. uh, project, they provided base levels of conditional assessment, fair, uh, poor, and good. Okay. Right. And from there, we use those as well as additional uh, work by Geotech to develop an investment plan that takes care of the poor, the mm -hmm. worst of the worst, um, and then put into sustainable asset management the fair and good through the life cycle analysis. Okay, thanks. Good Absolutely. Question. Commissioner Allen. Before we get to the numbers, I was holding my comments to the end. Um, so you might have to go back a couple slides, just so you know. Um, could you go back to the slide that you, you said, um, where you talked about equity lens? So I think it's important that that's flushed out more. Um, we as a commission led by our mayor and certainly um, uh, emphasized by the Rose Center Fellowship and the recommendations that I have, you know, we are trying to do everything through an equity lens. And I think it's, I'm not suggesting that your group did this, but it's real easy just to gloss over equity lens. Well, this was put through an equity lens, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that, um, I see Greg raising his hand. I, that, I want specifics, I want numbers, I want to know what that really means in real life. Um, that this isn't just done out of political pandering. Um, so, um, so I'm not asking you to do that now, but I'm telling you, I want that fleshed out more because that, that just, just to have that to be a slide and have that go through, I want to know what it means for the people who live in my neighborhood. Absolutely. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. Greg, do you want to respond to that before I go to my other issues? If, if I might. Well, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was on my list of questions. Um, is what does that mean, and was there an analysis geographically? Uh, so anyway, Greg, do you want to respond? Yes. Um, as you are aware, in our city, like most urban centers, uh, the poorest of our citizens live toward the center. They're uh, largely people of color. They're largely in the portions of the city that have the oldest infrastructure that we have. Infra the way that we build infrastructure today is far different than it was before. And so in many cases, people who live in older neighborhoods have less service from the city, less quality of life concerning street lighting than people who live in newer neighborhoods in our city. Let me give you a very concrete example that you're going to hear about this afternoon at your work session about street lighting on South Division. There have been complaints from people who live and work there that there's insufficient light, and from our police department, that there has been insufficient lighting. Well, we actually hired Geotech. They went out and they did readings. The, the lighting that the city is providing for South Division doesn't even meet our minimum standards that we would have in any other neighborhood. That's the notion of equity. We have to make sure that everybody receives those kind of equal services so that we don't have issues of crime or lower quality of life just because you live in an older part of the city with less or well, older infrastructure. Yeah, and um, if, if I can add to that, Greg, you know, we had conversation as to how do we deploy this, okay? 
So um, we're very sensitive that we don't deploy this with beginning with the areas they have the most or the downtown area, but how do we deploy this in a way that begin addressing those areas first and then we move into those areas that perhaps they won't see the, the impact as significant, you know? So in our conversation of, of viewing the, this through the equity lens is how do we make those investments when we deploy this in a way that is actually addressing those in first and that last in, in the process too. So again, as we move forward with this discussion and on, in subsequent meetings and subsequent time, I'm just telling you that as, as a commissioner, I want to see more meat yep. to those yep. bones. Um, and to me, I agree with you, Greg, that, you know, there's certain areas of the city that have older infrastructure and, you know, that's an equity issue as opposed to, you know, people who have, who have underground light, underground electric versus above ground, all that kind of, I understand that. But where where the rubber really hits the road is 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 in this. And so, um, and, the, and the example that I'll give, and there was nothing we could do about it because it was too late, but last year during our budget session, you're right, Chris, you did bring forward uh, as a part of your budget um, a fairly significantly large contract to hire some private companies to help us deal with our response time on street lighting. But I would point out that in, if I remember serves me correctly, I think it was close to $600,000, maybe 300000 I don't remember the number. It was a big number, and I know it was six figures, uh, and I know the first figure wasn't a one. Um, so. Um, those two contracts went to companies on the east side of the state. So when it comes to doing this work, if we're really going to look at this with an equity lens, there has to be a high level of intentionality about who gets to do this actual work and breaking it down into bite-sized pieces so it's not just some big company that goes around the nation doing this kind of stuff. That's what I'm, I'll not stand for that. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about um, is um, as I understand, um, so the, the concept of smart city was brought up. Um, I really want us to change our rhetoric when it comes to this A3. This is not about street lighting. That's what I first got a little bit upset about because I'm like, you know, we're spending all this money on, on street light. But then in conversations with Tom this morning, it's like, no, it's about the infrastructure. Once we looked at the street lighting issue, we realized we have an infrastructure problem. So really, this is, a, this is an electricity or an infrastructure problem. And so I think... We, I, but I, so at, this morning in our conversation, I brought up the agenda. So, well, it says right here on the agenda, we're talking about street lighting, Tom. So don't tell me we're talking about infrastructure because it says street lighting. So I, want, I think we need to change our, our language. In that context, um, what I've seen and what I've read about in certain cities is that um, what they do as a part of this switchover is, as, as Greg states, is far greater than, than just um, street lighting. There's um, cities, uh, Louisville, Kentucky is a good example. There's cities that um, have basically um, go, been able to wirelessly read water meters be, with the street lighting in those areas. So it eliminates the cost of having to have people go and out hopefully those staff can be redeployed, but I mean, there's a huge cost savings there. Um, there's um, safety issues with um, the ability to support police and fire in, in all the neighborhoods using this. Um, and um, I contend that there might even be a possibility down the road of, you know, if you're downtown, you have the free public Wi-Fi, maybe providing a city-fied Wi-Fi using the infrastructure that we're gonna put in. So as we consider this infrastructure that we're putting in, I really want to encourage us to, and maybe you're doing this already, So, but it doesn't come out in the A3, engage Allison in the work that she's doing. You know, What are some other energy savings that we could do through this system? Because if we're going to be tearing up this infrastructure, um, using Tom's analogy of an engine, um, I agree with you, but I want to put the right engine in. Um, we might need an eight cylinder as opposed to a four cylinder. Um, so, um, and I don't see that in here, but I think the long-term goal is, is what do we need not only now, but what do we need for the future to make, a, make ourselves a smart city. And then the last thing I'll say before you get to the numbers is, um, I strongly would encourage us to look, um, and I, I have an article, you can pass it around if you want. It's um, in last year, last summer, the state of Michigan passed the ability for um, tax exempt uh, lease to purchase programs to help, and I think that's a, a viable method for us to look at possibly funding this as opposed to the standard bond issuance, um, where it's financed through the savings and it's guaranteed and it's private. It's privately funded through through banks. Banks like this kind of thing. It's easier to set up. It's cheaper. It's easier to monitor as opposed to bond financing. So I would encourage us to look at that um, 
the TELP financing as, as a possible method for financing this as opposed to straight bond issuance. Yeah. So, um, Commissioner, thank you. Those are all really excellent comments. Um, I couldn't agree more. It's, this really is an infrastructure issue. Uh, we have been talking about uh, a lot of the new technology out there, largely more in our conversations around the smart zone. I think Kara's still here. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's opportunities potentially for monitor, monitoring air quality and water meter and Wi-Fi. You're, you're absolutely right. So potentially, uh, we could be doing, we could be looking at this uh, in a much broader, more holistic way. Uh, perhaps what would be helpful is to help us understand what this potentially could enable us to do. Uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of looking in the back to Kira as well. Um, it would be nice to have a list of if, if, if again, this is a conversation today, if we move forward with this um, and we go with the seven prong or whatever the infrastructure that is being recommended, what does that, what doors does that open for us? What does that enable us to do down the road? I think that would be helpful for us to know. Um, and then also I think there, it would be helpful to, uh, to look at other connections to quality of life. And I know a lot of us know this, but immediately I think of public safety. Uh, and we know that street lighting and lighting is connected to public safety. Um, so it would be good to kind of broaden this conversation to, to think more holistically about all of the potential impact this, this could have on quality of life um, throughout our city. So uh, city manager and then Tom looks like he wants to add something. Staff intentionally <laughs> stayed away from the potential or the uses of smart city technology we did intentionally make sure that if we replace the lightheads, that they will be of sufficient infrastructure that they can support these technology options. But in past discussions, there's been some divisiveness around this, and staff believes that our street lighting system is in a sufficient poor condition that we can no longer delay the discussion about are we going to have smart technology or not we need to start looking at our infrastructure the notion of smart technology will be happy mayor to do just as you asked we'll come up with a, a entire report of options that you could undertake and the cost for those but we are saying that we really need to look at our infrastructure here and know that the infrastructure that's available today that's being recommended by Geotech would support all of the smart technology. Well, and Greg, I want to be very clear. A lot of cities, they're not investing in those other, I mean, it's it truly, a lot of other cities, they're working with private sector partners mm -hmm. to provide Wi-Fi or to, to yep. monitor air quality or the There's a way to capitalize some of meter. that for us. Right. I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that the city should invest in in smart cities. I think there's a lot of good examples out there of when you have the infrastructure in place, like other types of infrastructure, you open up opportunities to work in partnership with the private sector. Yep. And so I just want to be And we're the clear. highway for rent. Yeah, and if I may, uh, to Mayor. For, for rent, at which we've talked about before, and we've already done some of that. Yeah, and the, um, you know, it's a conversation, I agree with Greg, that we can have later. The investment that's included in here for the LED lights, because that conversation is related to the LED lights, include the seven pin technology. So it includes the framework for those conversations later on to take place and support those technology. So just so you know that what is being proposed can support that later on. Okay. Which potentially could open up revenue. Streams. I agree with you. We are talk, having conversation in the water department. Can we go into meters? There are smart meters. So you don't deploy a team to go read them, but the signal can go to the nearest light, and that and that is sent to the to the uh, to the city. So we can it's real so we can have that information in real time. People. So I agree with you. But the current uh, recommendation or the current framework for the investment of the LED includes that framework to support later technology. Thank you. City Manager, One, any final thing to add to that? No. Okay. All right. So, uh, Commissioners, any questions at this point? All right. So, let's get to the back of the sheet. Okay. Um, so the top half of this this page is basically showing the different 
funding for the service levels. Service level C, uh, the critical safety improvements we'd address over the first two budget years. And then we'd also be rolling in the construction participation in what we call the Vital Streets Program, or um, I would say that includes water and sewer too. Anytime we have the road open, we would want to take take advantage of those efficiencies um, and share the cost with them. Uh, moving, moving down to service level B, that's when we're rolling in the asset management. Uh, this is, we consulted with Consumers Energy and they're recommending, um, you know, we, we kind of established the, what the industry standard was. Uh, so if you have a fixture that needs to be replaced every 40 years, they're saying more typically we, we do a conditional assessment and replace it probably every 80 or whatever the case may be. Um, also rolling in 50 grand a year for that assessment, the asset testing and inspection and um, the conversion. We talked about the dual systems we are running right now. And LED implementation, this was- pause just a moment? Sure. We didn't say that. Okay. Understand we have a 24 or 7,200 volt primary system and a 2,400 volt secondary system. Consumers no longer has 2,400 volt in their system. Uh, they have 7,200 volt and they even have a higher voltage, I think, for their, their real primary. The point is what we have, the technology we have is antiquated. Uh, because we have two different systems, we have to carry twice as many parts and everything is, is twice as complicated. And so one of the line items here, whether you do LED or not, is to go to a single 7200 volt system. Um, also teamed with this, so after we address the service level C assets moving into service level B, we also want to address the LED implementation as recommended by consumers. Um, you know, we have to get back up on our feet before we can approach LED. So uh, this rolls in the LED implementation consumers, um, says they can do it within over two budget periods. Uh, it also rolls in um, an annual cost of $8,900 a year. And the final step up would be the service level A. So that would be adding in more dollars towards asset management, uh, replacing, replacing outstanding assets uh, directly with our life cycle. So. Uh, the bottom cost, uh, you'll see uh, an uh, allocation for debt service. I'll talk about that more when I get into uh, sources of how to, you know, ways we could fund this. But we we did estimate a bond issue there, so you can see the annual uh, debt service cost. We structured it around what um, is currently uh, the debt service level in the capital reserve fund. Uh, the principal payments rolling in in 2022, I believe. Yeah. So um, going, going down to the bottom half of the page, these are the potential sources um, that, that could help fund this. Currently for street lighting, we run about a half a million dollars in, for just addressing their capital needs. For, and this, is, this strategy just assumes that's running out. We're at minimum gonna keep contributing 500,000 towards them. The next step is use, utilizing the capital reserve fund. Uh, in uh, 2000, after 2022, we start dipping into that uh, capacity. Once we have some bonds roll off in the capital reserve fund, we start taking advantage of that capacity. Uh, the next step is uh, transferring the savings realized from the general fund when we implement LED. Uh, LED require less energy to run. We also um, there's potential savings with the rollout. You don't always replace these fixtures one for one um, because they provide more light. So there's potential savings there. Uh, this estimate was, you know, again, working with the consumer's energy. And can, then... Can, can, oh, can I ask a question about that? In looking sure. at these numbers then, I'm estimating, and tell me if I'm wrong here, um, just for the LED light portion, we're looking at about a 12-year ROI, that the savings over 11 to 12 years would cover the cost of the actual investment, the seven million in investment. Is that about right? Sure, yeah. Um, and then uh, increasing the, having an additional set aside for the capital reserve fund, we would um, use about 400 grand off of that. 
Uh, another uh, source we came up with was increasing um, the additional revenue that the street lighting department charges other um, city departments, increasing that by a penny, so that should generate 93000 a year. And then uh, the incentive from working with Consumers Energy, um, implementing LED over two, two years, they would give us 189000 back a year. Also, I should mention that by implementing the LED over uh, 2019 and 20, that's how we realized the savings from utilizing LED. So to, re to get to that 600000 approximately a year, um, you know, we have to implement it you know, straight away. And then uh, the final source would be those bond proceeds. Uh, we estimate approximate twenty million dollar bond to help, you know, get us going on this. So, uh, the bottom section assumes if we fund that service level C and service level B, which includes the LED, uh, layering those sources we identified against these costs, gives you. Um, if you follow the cumulative total surplus or shortfall, you can see we can get to a sustainable, sustainable state in the out years. So, any questions? Oh, you know, I, I just have a question based on what Commissioner Allen said. Did you explore this tax exempt lease purchase program as an option? We have not. No. Now, this is just one strategy to to fund the current condition of the of the system and get to that service level B. So, okay. And I think that that would, um, we do plan to explore, remember that only applies to the LED portion of it because that's the only, the $8 million is the investment that has a, a, a saving attached to it. So the LED light, we can look at other options of financing that. But for the distribution portion of it, we will have to bond for that because uh, um, uh, that portion doesn't have any, any savings uh, per se. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Yeah, because, yeah, you know, as I read through this, and we had actually I talked about this uh, a few weeks back, was that what's what's really the, the tax lease, lease portions, there's a performance contract that guarantees a dollar amount back. So, I mean, the, the value of that is that is that you have a contractually obligated third party that's going to provide that savings offset, which in essence should at least equal if not more so so that I that agree. that eight eight million portion well we kind of estimate here and are going to be conservative estimated you know here that that's going to be a guaranteed line item back you know versus what we hopefully will see which is higher you know in terms of, of savings here so I, I think i think that's the benefit to maybe you know piecemeal this too mayor uh, to, to your point we're going to invest we're going to uh, jeff and i are going to look into it because if they um you know whether it's an esco or whether is that approach um, we can repay with the savings um, then uh, they can guarantee the savings and we can do that for the LED portion of it um, so we were investigating both of those options to see uh, if there are if it's financially less expensive than we bonding for the entire project because we want to look at their cost too so well I think what I add to this and you all know this because you're smarter on this stuff than I am but um, if if the if the third party involvement and the tax exempt uh, lease to purchase program works, there may be we may be able to take it to another level. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe add other things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to within the context of what we're looking at. Other forms of technology involved in this. And the other thing is, and I absolutely know nothing about this. I'll leave this up to you to research it. But I do know that when you involve in programs like this, and I could give several examples, um, there's ways to structure it that allow things to be eligible costs based on what you're trying to accomplish and but I'll let you figure that out um, within the context of, of the of the legislation but I'm sure there's certain aspects of this that might be able to be included in it um, I'll let you figure that out but okay all right, so I'm going to see if there's any other questions. As, as we said, commissioners, this was an opportunity to uh, have staff provide us with the information. We'll have time to uh, really process this and think through it, and then we'll have a conversation um, as we talk about uh, priorities and funding for, for next year. So, Commissioner. Mayor, just one comment. Um, I didn't see much or hear much about um, the utilization of solar energy. And I think that that's important if we're talking about a more comprehensive distribution system. So just keep that in mind as we have future discussions. As a matter of fact, there are some other creative um, way of providing power to the street lighting 
that um, the, um, we are considering to. It's that a can little potentially bit more advanced than solar. Or um, you know, we are putting about digestion system, and uh, so we had we want to investigate eventually other ways of doing that, okay. um, in uh, to create synergy. You know, but before we're done, Mayor, if I I just want to say thank you to the team. Uh, you know, we pretty much, you know, they have jobs and we took their time and geotech and consumers, um, staff spent a lot of time, Jeff, Molly, uh, Sean, the entire team. So I just want to say thank you to all of them because um, it took a lot of, uh, we did a lot of side business too. <laughs> and um, it took a lot of time to put it together. So I just want to say thank you to the team. So Tom, thank you. Uh, I also will add our collective thanks to all the staff who've worked on this. Um, Commissioner, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I know that I see Allison in the back. She's actively looking at solar. Um, and I also wanted to let you all know, because it's kind of been dormant uh, since, because of some of the changes uh, within the office, but uh, we will be starting in January, starting back up the sustainability team, as well as uh, kind of restructuring one of the teams to be more focused specifically on um, energy. So uh, Allison and I are in the process of kind of walking through what that looks like. Some of you will be asked to, I shouldn't say asked, I'll be appointing some of you. <laughs> I should probably ask you before I do it, um, to join me uh, in serving on both of those teams. Uh, and then we'll be adding some community uh, stakeholders and experts as well. So we're really restructuring. Uh, but those will get, now that Alice is in, Allison is in place, those will get up and running in full force early next year. And this will continue continue to be a conversation and solar will be um, talked about around that table so just that's just a quick update all right anything else okay we're gonna finish that up thank you again everyone uh, that leaves us 16 minutes I'm gonna forego the executive session uh, and we will I'll talk to our city attorney about potentially getting that on the agenda uh, for our next city commission meeting uh, we can do that so Let's talk about... Let me get it started, Mayor. Okay, so City Manager. You'll well, recall at your last meeting, uh, you considered and then reconsidered a uh, moratorium on um, beer and wine sales at SDM, SDD, or really uh, gas stations um, with the new permissive law uh, that the state recently passed. Staff, um, that is from the law department and planning, um, have met and uh, believe that we have laid out the framework that you can have a good discussion about this moving forward without uh, ruining the bottom line i think uh, what you ought to know is you have great latitude to make decisions as you would wish it felt like last week like you felt trapped um, and that you could only make limited decisions but in the end I'm suggesting to you that you have broad authority to make all kinds of decisions within state law. So um, with that, Suzanne will take us through this memo, and there are some key policy questions that I think you all need to have discussion about, maybe today, maybe not, because if you can't come to a consensus around those policy decisions, you're going to have a real hard time figuring out what to do with the ordinance. So with that, Suzanne. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, so I don't expect you to read all of this right now, but what we did is uh, had had a number of discussions about, um, you know, cur currently the environment has been changing, but really, um, to be use a pun, it's been brewing for a while. So uh, the, the debate about alcohol in our neighborhoods and alcohol approvals comes and goes, uh, and it kind of really has perked up uh, recently because of two changes in state, uh, state decision making. One is a public act, uh, 434, that was adopted this year, we went in effect this year on January 4th, that allows gas stations to have SDM licenses for the sale of beer and wine. And then the Michigan Liquor Control Commission has been considering a repeal of the half mile rule, which is uh, a requirement that liquor stores have to be a half mile apart. And so that is going through the process right now. It's currently at the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. And um, it's expected that by January that that would be in effect. So well, the neighborhoods have been talking about this and are concerned about it because of the amount of establishments that they see being approved. 
Um, and really this kind of question about uh, business friendly environment versus neighborhood quality of life comes to comes to light. You know, when we start talking about these different tensions, and that's and that's common. We we regularly face that with the planning commission debating about an alcohol approval and looking at um, how do we do this in a fair and equitable manner, allow for growth and development in our community and investment to happen, but also acknowledging that there's potentially deleterious effects from alcohol uses. Um, and uh, so how do you how do you balance those? And so uh, Greg had mentioned the regulatory authority. On page four of the memo, you'll see a little graph that really talks about what the MLCC does and what the city of Grand Rapids does. And our authority comes underneath the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, which allows for the regulation of uses, if I, I want to specifically read it. So a local unit of government adopt land development regulations under the zoning ordinance designate, designating or limiting the location, height, bulk, number of stories, uses, and and size of dwellings, buildings, and structures that may be erected or altered. So the city, we look at location and uses uh, when it comes to alcohol. The MLCC looks at the individual and or the, M, the LCC or whatever the entity is that's requesting the alcohol license. And so they're specifically looking at that. We cannot make land use decisions off of who the person is that is requesting the alcohol use. We have to look at the location and then whether or not it meets the standards. The LCC is looking at the person or entity that will be manufacturing, selling, distributing, eating alcohol and that is their purview and so the MLCC has their rules that they follow just like we have our ordinance um, and they go through a process when they're granting licenses to the distributors vendors um, and, and those those uh, producers about where um, or who I'm sorry who gets these so from a zoning perspective, we have a lot of latitude when we're saying what is an appropriate use uh, and where should it go within our community. The, um, the zoning ordinance currently recognizes there are some nuances in types of alcohol uses. So if we're thinking about a restaurant that closes before midnight, We've found over the years, we used to have those be special land uses. We used to require a hearing for every restaurant that wanted to have liquor sales. And we said, you know, if it closes before midnight and they're doing food and we haven't found any issues, let's make that administrative approval. So that change has happened within about the past seven years where we made that shift because we didn't find it was causing a lot of impacts. Um, we do use the special land use process with the hearing and review of the standards by the Planning Commission for uh, party stores and liquor stores and um, pack, especially off-premise sales uh, where you're selling beer, wine, or liquor, or spirits to go. Uh, and so there are other communities that have regulated this in a much more conservative fashion than what we do today. Uh, for example, Byron Center, if you want to have a liquor license, you have to have a full menu that includes desserts and appetizers and, and it has to be fully available for your restaurant. Uh, Come on, Byron, Byron Center is not a fair example. I, they didn't I, allow, I, they were a blue county for <laughs> their entire existence. I'm you just have, saying. Comparing Byron Township to the city of Grand Rapids is a I, little I, bit uh, All right, ridiculous. Commissioner, let's let Suzanne <laughs> finish. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> What, what, I'm, what I was meant by the example is that there's there's all a whole range of things that you can choose to allow and not allow. So uh, when it when it comes to this, so when we look at it specifically to Grand Rapids um, and, and how we do this. There's several policy questions that really come to mind. Um, whether or not uh, it is in, on page two, I kind of outlined those briefly. Is the saturation of alcohol outlets a concern for our city? Are we worried about that? And is there a difference between on-premise consumption, you know, when you're doing a restaurant, a brew pub, um, versus off-premise sales? Is there is there a distinction that we need to make or acknowledge with that? A particular concern for the neighborhoods has been more of the off-premise sales, uh, and uh, that's usually where we see, or off-premise uh, consumption is where we see more of the conflict happening. Uh, is there, the second question is, is there a greater common good that benefits from a regulatory environment designed to prevent potential secondary impacts resulting from the sale of alcohol? 
alcohol. And I don't mean that in a negative way. The real purpose of zoning, uh, in, in a lot of cases, when you have situations like this, is to prevent things from happening. It's trying to be proactive, and it can have different degrees of we don't want anything to happen anywhere because we're afraid uh, that there's going to be issues, or we're going to use caution. And there's some different levels, and if then kind of considerations that we might want to have, if it meets these criteria, then we'll allow it. So it's a little more caution, or you have a different set where you say we don't care, or we you know we're comfortable with it, um, and it's fine. With liquor, uh, particularly. There's a debate in the business community about whether you know it's the business owner's fault or the establishment's fault um, if there's the panhandlers outside. They're they're not encouraging the panhandlers. There's you know or the litter that might accumulate outside if there's minis or half pints that happen. There is a correlation, though, and then you get into this debate about causation and correlation um, of alcohol sales in neighborhoods in particular, but when we, we do know that there are these effects. So for example, I'll give you two. Uh, one is Foster Park, uh, right by Heritage Hill where the hiker is. We, um, they're across the street where the Family Dollar is now. There was used to be sales of off-premise um, for sales to go for alcohol. And um, people would t go buy their alcohol and come and drink in the park. And it resulted in so many neighbor complaints that the benches were removed from the park. So from a city policy standpoint, you're talking about a change in infrastructure Structure and trying to manage behavior in a different way. This afternoon, you'll see a presentation. Greg already mentioned it with Division Lighting in Hartside. And one of the particular hot spots is Division in Weston. Uh, and the question is is it not just, you know, lighting is certainly a critical factor when we're talking about safety in that neighborhood, but then also. But for the party store that's there, would we have similar issues? So that is that compounding or adding to some of the issues in the crime that are occurring in that neighborhood. So we, we run into kind of those, is it directly the result of the business or is it these secondary pieces that kind of go with the activity? And usually it's with alcohol sales. Susan, I have a question. Uh, can, can there be different rules based on districts? So I'm thinking of like what we did with uh, food trucks, right? We said each quarter improvement district could um, come up with their own policy related to allowing that in their district or not. So is that, uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious, is that a possibility to have it be more driven by neighborhoods and by um, you know business districts based on the data that they have. I mean, I, I looked at, uh, you know, some of the correlations and maps, and um, I think there, there could be an argument that it's more problematic in certain neighborhoods than other neighborhoods. So I'm just curious. You cannot, if, if you're talking different zone districts, so if in, in, in my language when I use districts, it's like the city center being downtown or traditional business areas being the neighborhood business districts. Those, in zoning, we can distinguish between that, uh, between those districts, but if we're talking specifically about different business areas, uh, we cannot really distinguish between them and give them latitude on which uses they're going to allow and which uses they're not. Uh, one of the tenets of zoning is we have to treat similar uses the same within the same zone district, so we can't, we can't make that nuance. Okay, thanks. Um, Suzanne, thanks for this information. Um, I was hoping that today we would come back to this table to fully talk about um, the role of the Planning Commission, what we're expecting them to conquer before it comes to the Commission. It seems like last time we met and talked about this in the evening, um, there was some confusion about their role and um, and what they had heard from staff about what they can and cannot do. 
And so I was hoping that today we would kind of iron out some of the pieces that are confusing. I think kind of this historical perspective that you've given is um, important, but I'm kind of looking more for, okay, this is what the planning commission should consider. This is what the public will need to do or if they have issue or concern. Um, this is when it'll come to the commission. These are the options of the commissioners when it comes before us. Um, but that's not this, so I don't know how do we get to that place. Um, and I need to leave in three minutes to get downstairs to public safety because that's a commitment I've made that I want to honor. Um, so just wanted to ask those questions and make those comments. Those, those are good questions. And um, I know Suzanne wasn't able to be at our night meeting and hear some of the questions that we had around right. this table um, when we reconsidered the vote. Uh, so. I know we have the, in light of time, I know we have our um, work session from one to four today. I don't know if that gives time for Suzanne to pull together some of that information that we could continue this conversation at the beginning of that session, um, or if we could, Greg, do you have thoughts? I, I, I think given enough time, Suzanne would get you there, okay? She, right. She's ready to lead you to that. She may be going long on background, but whatever the point is, she's going to get you there. So, Mayor, okay. if you can set up a time, say, after 4 o'clock or before your 7 o'clock or even next week, we can continue this discussion and get you to where I think you wanted to be in your discussion. Well, how about I propose this, Commissioners? We have um, lunch scheduled today at noon with the session starting at 1.00. Can we start closer to 12.30 or 12.40 at 12.30 and um, come back to this topic first okay. since we've run out of time this morning. That way we can honor the public safety committee meeting that is going to happen in a minute and four seconds uh, and still give us time. It, and maybe even between then, between now and then, we can have a chance to read some of this. So Does for that the, sound good? Yeah, so for the sake of a published meeting, we can't start the published meeting early, so we need to recess this one so that when we start at 1230, we're still in the right meeting. Thank you, Commissioner. I think our city attorney is probably going to oh, tell okay. me. So so we will not adjourn this meeting. We will just recess it. Thank you so much. Um, and we will take uh, we'll go to public safety, have lunch and then be back in here at 1230. Can we have a discussion? You and I? Am I breaking the rules? But can we recess We're and not adjourn the committee of the whole meeting? Yeah. Here, and recess it? Oh. Let's just recess committee of the whole and we'll reconvene committee of the whole to continue this conversation, which was already on committee of the whole agenda at 1230. Okay. That's okay. Good? Good? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm so glad I have colleagues that know Robert's rules. <laughs> so, um, okay. So we're recessed. We'll be back in here at 1230. Uh, and those of you serving on public safety, you're down in 601. Let's get started. So, um, commissioners, we're reconvening our Committee of the Whole to finish up our discussion about the conversation related to alcohol sales. So we'll invite Suzanne back up. <clears throat> so while you were on your break, uh, we put <laughs> we put in front of you the special land use review standards as well as the alcohol review standards that the planning commission uses when they make their decisions. Uh, Commissioner Lanier had asked specifically about the planning commission process for approval of alcohol uses. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about that in briefly and then also the regulatory approaches that the City Commission might want to consider. The approval process that we use for special land use, um, when the Planning Commission, we, we notice uh, neighbors and do the publication in the newspaper uh, and then it both no notice the Neighborhood Association if it's applicable as well as residents within 300 feet which is pre prescribed by the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. Um, the Planning Commission conducts their hearing. When they make decisions, they are required to look uh, at their standards in making their decision. And what happens during that process is planning staff has provided them with a resolution. The resolution lists the standards in a table. And uh, as part of that table, there is a column to approve and to deny, providing them both with ways they could argue either in favor or against uh, an item for them to consider when they make their decision. 
Uh, they, they take that into account in addition to the public testimony that might be provided both written and oral at the meeting uh, and then they render a decision. Um, the, the, the challenge is, is that it's not a, by a popular vote, so if we have neighbors showing up, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Planning Commission will deny it, that um, the Planning Commission is required to follow their standards, and so there, but some of the information provided by the public may be beneficial in determining detriment or impact that we would require this Planning Commission to take that into consideration. The Planning Commission, as stated in my memo, also can um, add conditions to a special use approval. So, for example, hours of operation, um, the amount of shelf space, mm -hmm. the number of cooler doors, other requirements that might mitigate or lessen the potential impact of that use on surrounding uh, properties. And so um, when they do that, you know, they kind of, they take into account that testimony and make their decision. The standards, and I think maybe where the confusion has been, Commissioner Lanier mentioned that um, a planning commissioner had said that they were instructed by staff to, to they couldn't deny this. Um, it wasn't it wasn't by me, that's for, for sure. The um, the the confusion may be in that we oftentimes talk about how does the standards apply to this decision, and whether or not they could justify the decision um, that they're making based on what information that's available to them. So if they're saying, um, well, two cooler doors isn't going to make a big impact, uh, you know, if they're selling beer and wine sales and 16 square feet of shelf space, how are they determining that? That, um, for example, if the entire building is 10,000 square feet and they're only using 2% of that square footage for sale area, is that different than selling milk or um, Sobeys at their gas station versus you know, is, is, is beer and wine another beverage selection that's available, or is it going to have a deleterious impact on surrounding uses? And so they have to debate that when they look at their standards. So for example, when you look at special land use review standards, particularly neighborhood number two, the proposed use will be compatible, harmonious, and appropriate with the existing or planned character and uses of the neighborhood, adjacent properties, and natural environment. Um, so they look at these potential uh, impacts in neighborhoods and debate them and make their decision based on those standards. Um, when they've had that, it's been a challenge because they'll have testimony from neighbors saying, well, they don't pick up trash or we don't like the owner or the owner has been rude to us and he, um, you know, we find it difficult to work with him. They can't make their decision based on who the owner operator is of the business. They have to look at the situation of the property and the particular use that's being requested. So that, that, that fine line is where we get into kind of how are they making decisions and, and what is it that, about that particular use when they're having that debate. Susan, can I ask a, a question? Uh, and then I'll go to Commissioner Allen. Okay, so this is this is helpful. Thank you. Um, it seems to me with this process, with the review standards, a neighborhood could make the case that there could be a negative impact on the neighborhood, and, and they could actually probably pull from some of the heat maps that you actually provided to all of us. Um, and so I, I would think that there would be, with with the special land use and the and the alcohol review standards, there would be an opportunity to deny and not feel compelled to say yes to every single one. Like I think I think about the, because I do think this is neighborhood specific. Um, I think about the gas station issue, right? Like a, a year ago or two years ago. Um, over on Carlton and Fulton, the neighbors were very adamant that that was not the highest and best use of that corner. Yep. Adamantly opposed a gas station. It was denied. But then on the west side, Fulton, the other side of uh, the city, the neighbors were very supportive of a gas station and that was approved. So how is, how is this different than, let's say, a situation like that? It's the, it's the same. The, it's just, what, what's the argument that the neighbors can make in support or against whatever the particular request is that's in front of them. That adds to the Planning Commission's understanding of how the standards should be applied. 
Okay. So the Planning Commission has discretion when they make decisions to approve or deny through the use of the standards, which is why we give them, when we give them a sample resolution, there's an approve and deny column because I, I always feel you can argue it both ways. Okay. Commissioner Allen? I would, I would agree with you that it would be extremely unwise for the Planning Commission to deny based on the owner or who owns it. But in the case of the BP in Easttown, there was actually evidence that the person was, you have to, an owner has to have some level of responsibility in how they sell the alcohol, as far as, you know, carting people and all that kind of stuff. Um, they brought forward the fact that this particular gas station owner was actually selling it before he actually had the, the special land use, and they had evidence of that. So that would indicate that a person is not being responsible. And then to echo what the mayor is saying, when I read number five on alcohol sales review standards, you know, what I, I read the transcripts of what the East Town Neighborhood Association and the Business Association brought to the Planning Commission in, in opposition to this particular gas station getting its license, and they, they specifically talked about some of the issues that are listed here, <coughs> yet it was still, so if those are the review standards that the Planning Commission is supposed to follow, then why, I'm just curious, on what basis did they approve it or deny the, the neighborhood's concerns? Thing, evidence concerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean to you speak were, on behalf of the planning. Commission, I understand right? You're, you you shouldn't. But they but they um, they have had a different opinion about it, and I think that's the challenge. Is when I started the earlier background discussion is that th I think there is a philosophical question in here about how much alcohol and you know is alcohol a common thing that we're accepting as a community or not, and I think that's part of this discussion about the right of the property owner versus what impacts it has on a neighborhood. I mean, to, not to belabor a point, but uh, you gave it as an example, so I'm able to bring it up, but there's a, uh, not a, there's not an application yet, but there's a proposed application for the Shell Station on, in Boston Square. Mm. No, that one's been approved. That was approved? Yes. Oh, that I and was, and there was a woman who came and spoke, and, and one of the considerations I had in, in here was, uh, you know, social equity or you know whether or not there's a disparate impact on potentially vulnerable populations. And she raised those issues to the planning commission, and the planning commission felt that that was not not something that that two cooler doors would impact. So, Commissioner O'Connor, and then Commissioner Lanier, did you have a question? Okay. So I, I just. First off, I thank you for providing all this information, um, including the review standard stuff. And so I think initially one of the biggest concerns was this idea of the more uh, re re surrounding the idea of the moratorium is that there are really two issues at play here. Um, and we're trying to use one tool in a broad brush stroke to look at nuance. And I think a lot of the decisions that we have to make regarding land use involve nuance. And it's not just that every decision that we make, because we learn about potential negative effects by painting this issue in a broad brushstroke last two weeks ago. Um, so that being said, I think what, when we, we talk about land use, and then you talk, you can't judge it based on a bad owner. I mean, there are, there are mechanisms and tools in place through the state of Michigan and the Michigan Liquor Control and Enforcement Division to, to address some of those concerns. And I often find, feel like maybe from the neighborhood perspective that they haven't taken the time to, to use the tools that are available to try to hold those you know, if we can't use discretion against someone's uh, personality or their uh, their business practices, that's not something that we, through land use controls, can have impact over. But if someone is doing something like selling something before, the, I mean, from the state of Michigan perspective, if he was selling alcohol without a special land use, he was certainly in violation of some Michigan law because it's required to get your permit to have the local approvals. And so there should be an enforcement action taken from the state level to, to address that, which then may can have a, a, maybe it'll have an impact on a future decision as we look to provide a special land use. But if we haven't done the diligence from the, the level up from us, then then this is sort of a moot point that we're trying to use land use to control behavior. Secondly, I think that there's an opportunity to look at you know and, a, and this this idea of correlation and causation. Uh, you know, I think because there's correlation doesn't necessarily mean that there's causation, uh, especially when we look historically back. I mean, most of our data will look at what has happened in the past, and we're, we're a city in growth and in transition at this point in our tenure. Um, if you would have looked at Bridge Street 10 years ago, um, 
you know, you had some not too uh, amazing businesses operating down there that have now transitioned, and now we're in a different phase of the city of Grand Rapids environment where we see restaurants and breweries and, you know, what was one of the most detrimental bars on the west side is under new ownership and is now a positive impact on the neighborhood. So just by saying that in the past there's been alcohol and there's been negative things happening, that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that having alcohol creates potential future things. I mean, this morning we voted unanimously 7-0 to approve another alcohol license on Wealthy Street without any discussion or debate, guys. That we see that when done correctly, alcohol can have a positive impact on the uh, creating a better social fabric for our neighborhoods. And so just we have to, I understand that there's nuance in this. So it's finding the right tools and the right mechanisms to, to address this stuff given the context of you know land use is the thing that we have the control over. Well, and maybe, Suzanne, you can speak to that, um, because I think all of us have examples like that, where we know that there's liquor stores or stores that sell liquor where there is not a negative impact on the neighborhoods, and then we know that there are others. We know that ownership and management right. does impact it. So, Well, and I think well, from the half-mile rule perspective, though, I think one other thing we didn't really necessarily talk about much is, so in no industry does can you create a monopoly. So when you create a, a half-mile boundary to say this is a bad business, um, and no one else can come within a half mile of this business, um, that business has a monopoly on being bad. They have a monopoly to be the only player in town that gets to, to create or to sell what you perceive as an evil. And so the only way that you make that, that business get better is to A, use the enforcement mechanisms that are in place, or B, create competition so that that person either has to be a better business owner because, you know, we all like, it doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in, we all like to shop at nice places. We all like to go to places where we feel safe, where we feel respected, where we know we're not going to get harassed or badgered when you leave the business. You, we all want to go to those places that are clean. And so if, if you have a business that is the only business within one half mile, it is the only opportunity for any potential customer to uh, access something that they want or they have to drive out of their neighborhood. Well, Suzanne, can you speak to two things that um, Commissioner O'Connor brought up? One is having lived through trying to trying to have a liquor license removed from a business owner, yes. it's a it's a heavy lift, yeah. um, a very heavy lift, and, and it requires significant documentation mm -hmm. and a lot of work on the city attorney's part. Yeah. So maybe talk, because I think people think that that's an easy solution, and having gone through it um, as a city commissioner, my experience is it wasn't easy, and it took a lot of resources. So if you can maybe speak to that. And then secondly, uh, but removal is not the only enforcement mechanism. I mean, well, fi fines, my, fines hurt too. Commissioner, please let me finish. Um, the second question is the whole one around enforcement. So we've also, many of us around this table, have dealt with that, where we have had party stores that are problematic, and we've looked at all of the solution or all the potential solutions, and we've looked at what are some of the requirements and what can we enforce. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? And and I think it's important for all of us to know what. What can we do when we have, as Commissioner O'Connor says, a bad apple? It's really, zoning is not the mechanism. I mean, and that's the hard part, is that um, it is enforcement using the police department, vice unit, uh, even even if you're being proactive, vice unit doing inspections on all of these businesses to make sure that they're kind of staying within the boundaries. Um, but to, to actually shut down a, a liquor establishment, it takes, I mean, large amounts of documentation, as you've mentioned, um, and, and something that rises to the occasion. And the difficulty is, is that they're looking at it from a state perspective, which is not the local, they're not getting the phone calls from the neighbors. They're not um, hearing from the other businesses around it that are being affected. Uh, and so it, it is a much higher bar to actually have one removed. There are fines and other things that are available for the LCC to do that. But again, it's it's a lengthy process. And I think the, the difficulty is, um, with any of this from an enforcement standpoint is the resources dedicated for enforcement and whether or not they're sufficient when we have problems, you know, whether it's for nuisance or noise or, um, you know, illegal sales, those all take different resources to stay on top of it. And it's not eight to five. Uh, for alcohol businesses. So that that does make it more difficult. The question I think is, what are the bumpers you as a legislative body want to put on uh, this lane uh, for what's acceptable and what's not? And, and what is permissible where you feel that there's going to be no detrimental effect and whether or not you can have very clear rules about those expectations? Um, or if you think they're needed, 
So for example, on, on page six, if I can direct you to that, this does provide you some op opportunities to look at how we currently regulate alcohol uses. So um, right now, when the Planning Commission makes their decision, it's pretty wide open. We have uh, a use regula regulation section, Article 9 of the Zoning Ordinance, that um, has other, we have other requirements in, for other uses that are very clear. Like we expect an acre of land for an auto repair facility because we know that the cars pile up and they, we don't want them all over the streets. Um, we have for, for drive throughs we have very specific requirements. We don't have those types of requirements for alcohol uses, and I don't know if you want them. But, um, you know, for example, for gas stations, because the Planning Commission has established a pattern of decision making, uh, and if you, you don't believe, uh, the Planning Commission has felt that th there was not a significant detriment to the neighborhood if there's two cooler doors, maybe we codify that. Um, and just make it administrative approval so that it's really clear about this is the extent of what we're willing to accept um, from an approval standpoint. If you're going to go beyond that, then it's another, you know, it's a more lengthy approval process with the Planning Commission. Um, there's, there's hours of operation you can regulate if it's an issue. The difficulty is that we're trying to balance kind of citywide and all of all potential alcohol uses by neighborhood or by building, uh, and how do we apply it? And that's where the Planning Commission is useful in looking at those standards and being able to apply conditions of approval when they take that into consideration. And um, and that's you know working with the Planning Commission and training. We have several new members, and attendance, as you know, has been a challenge. So trying to kind of get into a rhythm of consistent decision making, I think. Um, that balances the use of the standards with the needs of the neighborhoods is is an art that um, still needs some additional work. Mayor. Uh, okay. okay, and then Commissioner Kelly, I think I saw her hand up first, and then uh, Commissioner Lerner, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was after O'Connor. Okay, so I'm sorry, so I'll go Lanier, Kelly, Jones, Schaefer. Uh, so, Suzanne, um, I think Commissioner Allen, when he brought up the gas station in Boston Square, so, one of the concerns that at least that was expressed to us was tied to the fact that Walgreens directly across the street from the gas station sells maybe beer and wine and then two doors down there's a um, yep. store that sells <coughs> alcohol and beer and wine and so you know those are just the saturation of alcohol and because it was passed you know there were some other concerns that were brought up about who the owner is now versus who the owner is was before and had that owner been the same owner that it probably wouldn't have gotten past because of other things so I'm just you know and they were um, attributing it to um, racial inequities um, and so I just I think those are just some of the concerns going back to the question about what is it that citizens can do because if, if we've already had neighborhoods and people coming forward expressing some of the things outlined in here and the results are still approvals, I just don't understand what the solution is. I, you know, I still don't feel like I'm clear. I think if there's angst around this, and, and there clearly is, I mean, the businesses aren't happy because they, you know, they feel it's somewhat subjective. Neighborhoods are frustrated. I'm hearing frustration from you as well. As a legislative body, you can make the rules on how those decisions are made if there's specific requirements that you think are necessary to be included in the code that the Planning Commission is not following. But. I guess I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, why aren't they following it? I, I, that's the piece that I'm missing. Why aren't they doing what we've asked them to do when we said yes to them being appointed to that commission? So you're ask, what you've asked them to do is apply the standards in their decision making mm -hmm. for each request. Mm -hmm. And Some of those are outlined in the document that you yep. have here. And when people come forward expressing opposition using what's in here, then what's expected of them is to have a decision that indicates that they've listened to the people who have come forward and they're making a decision based on that. 
They're not outside of the law. It's within the parameters that we've given them. So somehow, some way, and just for clarification, I never said that someone from the Planning Commission said that you told them anything. Um, what I expressed was that last time we met in the evening, someone else expressed that there was some confusion about what you say and what the Planning Commission says about this. And so there's some confusion, somehow, some way. They seem to believe that they should be approving all of these. The community seems to believe that they have some, some means of communicating their opposition that will result in, uh, hopefully, denials. And we have this assumption that there will be work being done at the Planning Commission level because it, before it becomes um, at the Commission level that will rectify some of these issues. We recognize that there will be those times when they can't and it will come to us, but the reason we have this step in between is because we want these things to be resolved at that level. Yep. Yeah. Commissioner Kelly, then Jones and Schaefer. Yeah, I think, and partially in response to what Commissioner Lanier is, her frustration that she's expressing, I think that so much of this is maybe too subjective right now. So wondering what we can do around measurements. For example, um, you mentioned the MLCC can do fines. We all know how difficult you know it is to enforce, whether it's this or I'm thinking about we've had um, other situations where you've been called upon to do enforcement around um, bed and breakfast kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, it can take years. Yes. And it's, we just don't have those kind of resources, neither, neither does the police department. So, but we do have records. Um, I'm wondering if we can um, add fines at, as a city of Grand Rapids tied to the number of um, Grand Rapids Police Department calls, for example, so we can beef that up in terms of enforcement. And that would be something that we can measure in a neighborhood area. And then the ratio of the cooler size to the food that's provided there. You know, we have food deserts. We'd like to see more um, food in some of these smaller stores, for example. I don't know about gas stations, but but is there some ratio that we could, could look at? We talk about how um, we've approved restaurants because they're serving food and it's on premise. So if we're going to do off premise, do we, do we tie some food sales to that? We could look at percentage of sales. Um, I saw that in your list of regulation approaches as well as the, sh the, the shelf and cooler space. And then um, SEPTED, add this requirement. Um, I know that's more work on the part of the police department again, but it would become, I think, for new establishments, a benchmark against which we could judge any changes that were happening if, if, if there were complaints made. And then finally, I think a lot of this points to training. And um, Commissioner Jones and I had a conversation with folks at Uptown last week. and. And um, one of the members of their board was talking about having worked in the Grand Rapids Township area, and I sh shared this with you too, Suzanne, that he had gone through a, a mandatory three-hour training about for the Planning Commission, and then you indicated that we might also be able to do some training. I'd like to see it videotaped so that you didn't have to constantly use your staff resources, but for our residents, whether it's the neighborhood associations or LINK or other groups that want to be um, understand the process and be given some opportunity to just go online and and take it and then review it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, MSU Extension in partnership with the Michigan Association of Planning has a citizen planner program. Mm -hmm. uh, several of our planning commissioners have been through that program um, and we do offer to pay for that for them to go through it and so we've been uh, looking at the training programs that we could offer them and have been discussing uh, opening that up for the community to participate as well. Do we know if we can do fines? That's, so that a, that's a legal to... question with Anita. I don't know. Okay. So if if we have issues where the police department are repeated, you know, it's repeatedly um, called to come to a certain establishment. Um, if that's it, it might not be that. It might be some other kind of fine. If we find out that. Um, as it is now, our permitted use, less than 33% of gross sales is from the sale of alcohol. I don't know how closely we track that, but if they fall outside of that. This, this is proposed, so right now we don't monitor that. So we, could we find that then we as could. well? Mm -hmm. In, in, in terms of making a tool, like you say, to actually do enforcement that, that works, it doesn't take forever. You can find them if they've broken the law. You have to have... 
So if we pass an ordinance like this, I'm sorry. So if we pass an ordinance where we added this recommendation, then we could fine them if they break that law. We, if it's in the zoning ordinance it, it, and it's not based on police calls, like if it's in the zoning ordinance and you're saying these are the rules that we want in zoning, mm -hmm. um, using Table Six as an example, um, we we could we can ticket for zoning violations. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, oh. yeah, I guess you'd have to weigh in on that and have a conversation with planning. But right. and if there's if there's a zoning violation and they're written up for that. There's already penalties that are associated with that. And if there's things that they've committed that are you know, criminal, like they're disturbing the peace as a result of it, or there's some activity that you can directly relate to the mm -hmm. business where they've broken the law, then we already have fines associated with whatever law it is that they're, they've broken. Well, and think about it too, like with, uh, and I think there's things in our uh, building inspection code that oftentimes don't, you know, the, the window transparency is a perfect example that oftentimes you see a bad actor has c windows covered with things that you can't see and it doesn't create a warm and welcoming environment like we want. Now, that involves enforcement action, but, you know, sometimes it's not the, the crime that you get in trouble for, it's using those other, I mean, it's, it's Al Capone, he didn't go to jail for being a mobster, he went for tax evasion. It's like, how are we going to get somebody to be a good player if they're not a good player because they have peeling paint on their building, they, they don't mm -hmm. take care of their space, they have lack of window transparency, you have to use the tools you have available to hold people accountable to the community standard. And so I oftentimes we think we, we fail in some regard in that in that effort because there's a lot of places that operate and it's hard to, you know, we are a enforcement by, uh, you know, complaint, by complaint, complaint system mm -hmm. that we operate mm -hmm. in, so. Yeah. And Commissioner, I don't think you can punish for future crimes. If there's, um, you can develop a, a record of where they've been breaking the law or causing problems, and then we can take that and provide it to LCC. We've had that historically with a couple of the bars, and so they're a repetitive problem, and so we alert them, and they start to, that kind of red flags it for them, and then they start to, um, to watch it as well. Mm -hmm. um, one bar I can think of specifically is. Um, I think it was 10 bells over on the northwest side. Mm -hmm. So that became such a problem, then LCC started to watch it, mm -hmm. and they ultimately did pull their liquor license. But the, again, it, it's such a long process, it's so labor intensive. Yeah. And I, I guess. All right, then I'm going to go okay. to Commissioner Jones. Okay. Yep, just um, want to make mention of the fact that what makes this, I think, um, very disturbing is that. I think we could look at it through an equity lens. Um, if we were to, historically, the, 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 the concern of the complaint would be that there's a proliferation of uh, establishments that are located in the urban core where you have uh, a high concentration of marginalized populations. And uh, that also, and quite often, those same neighborhoods have a lack of organized uh, neighborhood associations, and so therefore you have um, the, that, that, those particular neighborhoods uh, being developed um, based on the philosophy of a planning commission coupled with business owners. Um, I understand the law of supply and demand. I understand that any business owner who recognizes the potential for uh, greater sales and increased revenue, he or she is going to go and look to perhaps open up shop in that particular neighborhood. I get that, right? But the issue that I'm having is it, it's, it's not the issue of, of, of having voice uh, because we've seen instances, and again, we'll use the example of, of, um, of BP, where you had a very organized effort um, that uh, followed the letter of the law in terms of the standards that, that they had to list as to why this particular establishment could, you know, should not be given a license. And they too came up short. And so um, it, I have great concern because I'm looking at it as something that um, it's, I think it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to take a good hard look at the planning commission. Um, I, have, I for one of, the, one of the things, since I have the opportunity to have the microphone, I want to make mention is uh, one of the things I, I would like to advocate for is to change um, the, the meeting time of the Planning Commission. 
that would give folk an opportunity who perhaps work an eight to five job, nine to five job, to be present at the planning commission meetings. And this would mean perhaps a starting time of four or five o'clock. And it's, if it goes long, it goes long. Um, but also to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a form of incentive, is to uh, provide uh, a stipend of some kind to planning commission members. Because what I'm, what I'm most concerned about is I keep, you know, my, my, uh, my narrative has been that we are a legitimate medium-sized city and we are experiencing big city problems. Um, I think it would be in our best interest to begin to operate with tremendous foresight and prepare for, um, you know, the issues that, that, that are coming our way. Instead of being reactive, we need to be more proactive. I think that also starts with planning because, again, we have the issue of people wanting to live in the city. There's a desire to, uh, to, to again, <clears throat> increase density and, and have more people here. These are all new things for us, I think, in many ways, as a city. But do we have the capacity right now to be able to deal with this new norm? I don't, I don't think it's the case. And I think that one of, the, one of the areas in which we have to, I think, have a greater focus on is the area of planning and the planning commission, because that concerns me. Again, it's in the past, and it's, I've experienced this, where you have a united front. You have residents who have come. They come to the planning commission. They express their concerns. They come in numbers, and the Planning Commission recognizes the indigenous wisdom that is there. And it's not that, and I'm not saying that the Planning Commission should always go with the loudest voice, but if they're presenting it in a way that really speaks to the potential detriment to the neighborhood in which they live, I mean, who are we or who is the Planning Commission to say, well, you know, you know, I can appreciate your opinion or how you feel, but we feel, a, we feel another way because we think this is best. So just really, really concerned right now at, at this dynamic of having those who are voiceless compared, as well as those who have voice and the same result. And it, thank you, Commissioner. Very well said. Because when I look at this and I look at special land use, there's clear opportunity to deny based on what, I mean, maybe this, as Commissioner Kelly said, this needs to be, um, a little more specific. I actually think it's pretty clear. Yeah. I, I mean, this is really clear to me how you make the case for a special land use. So anyway, I, I share your sentiment. Commissioner Schaefer. Yeah, uh, I just say overall, when it stands for me, first let me just say I think we should pay people who spend six hours or more on a board, which is what their lengthy mm -hmm. meetings are. We probably owe that to that and probably owe it to that level of expertise that we ask them to have. Mm -hmm. So I okay. definitely would, would fully support what you're saying there. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, also, having served on the Board of Zoning Appeals, it does, does take you about a year to get your handle on what the what you're looking at because it is so, so large. The, the thought, I think, and I think the some of the focus on what's being asked of us is is also to look back and see if there's any any changes to be made to, to make it more clear and there's some ordinance uh, pieces back here you know from my standpoint I can I can tell you just from an overall theory and thought of it is is I see zoning and regulating um, the, the market as one that's supposed to look mostly at at um, use and land value meaning that I, I think when we kind of get into more around what are these <coughs> secondary effects of uh, violence and crime around what we do that's that that in my mind gets us out of that land use out of that um, property value space and, in, and into more of that space where I think we over regulate or could over regulate in the, the, the market so you know from that standpoint I, I think the process that we have now lays out a way to do that and it, it's it's subjective for a reason you know because I think if you just say that it's what the neighborhood wants then then I think you really don't have a, a master plan and you really don't have what's clear for, for the market you just have whatever people show up for in their neighborhood is what gets approved for land use and I think that that doesn't provide the clarity that's needed for long-term sustainable growth so so I think either we more define that as a city body and debate that we don't want this use and you know I'll clearly state that or or we just kind of let let the process be as it is because 
I think the danger to allow that development by a neighborhood doesn't allow for a, a growing and thriving continuous city where it's a it's a melding between business and government. That's my opinion. Commissioner. Any other Commissioner uh, Well, I appreciate Commissioner Jones uh, bringing it up and Commissioner Shaver you know, lending his support to uh, uh, the professionalization of the Planning Commission. Um, you know, I think we, we actually know that they have, they have two meetings a month often, both lasting in excess of six hours. So that's you know, 12 hours out of what is you know, st a standard 40-hour work week. You're asking uh, a citizen to you know, give up that opportunity to make a living during that period of time, during the daytime when they should be working as well. So not only is it hard for the public to join, but it's difficult for people to attend. So um, it's going to tax the planning department staff and their legal staff and the other folks in there to have to move to a night meeting. So I'm not opposed to finding a, a, a threshold where the meetings could be shifted, but that being said, I appreciate the idea of, of you know providing compensation and ultimately, though, also holding some of our planning commissioners accountable for that attendance, which mm -hmm. we have not done, um, frankly. We're that, talking about that right now yeah. you know, with appointments. Okay, that there needs to be some mm -hmm. you know folks potentially removed for their lack of attendance. It's just unacceptable that if you know you commit to providing that. Uh, uh, service to your community and then you don't show up to do the job that's that's frankly to me just an unacceptable uh, thing I understand we all have issues that come up we can't make every meeting but um, uh, cool and I think one other thing and to Commissioner Shaver's point I agree with everything you said about land use uh, I think certainty is important I think that's part of the reason we had a conversation about this changing at, the, at our, our last meeting was that people need certainty people need to know that if you have a property that can be developed that this is the this is the way in which I go from point A to point B and uh, if that certainty cannot be provided then you pe people don't know people aren't going to spend the time to go we hear that complaint all the time oh, I don't want to spend nineteen hundred dollars to try to get a special land use if I don't know I can be successful um, so having a good framework for certainty to get something that is the standard and if you want an excess of the standard then yes you have to t you have to take the chance to go in front of the body to to plead your case, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally open to the idea of laying out some approvable standards for alcohol use in our zoning district. I think that's a that's proper land use. That's a, that's a good framework to have this in, not just painting it with a brush brush stroke to say we don't want any. Uh, I have a, I have a question. So for the approvals that have already been given, uh, where. Some in the community feel very strongly that their voice wasn't heard in the decision-making process and that these standards that we clearly have already in place weren't really considered. Um, the appeal process is to go to the BZA. There's a cost to that. Um, I've heard a couple of community groups say it's really difficult for us to do the appeal because of the cost. Mm -hmm. So is there an opportunity for us, for those who feel very strongly um, and they want to appeal to waive the appeal and have it be heard, have appeals be heard in front of the BZA so that they have a second body review the request. So that's one question. Um, and then and then my second question, and I guess I, I'm going to kind of look to my colleagues on this, uh, is you know what is some directive that we have for Suzanne and the planning department as we move forward because this is going to continue to come up. Mm -hmm. I think there are some things we need to talk about. I'll follow up with the appointments committee about the planning commission. We can also talk about stipends. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Um, we can have that conversation with the appointments committee uh, and then also follow up on the, the feasibility of, of adjusting the time for the meetings um, and maybe even in looking at adding one a month if we have to. Uh, so Three. can you speak to those? those couple points <laughs> so appeal yeah. and then um, yeah yeah the appeals um, it really in your omnibus fee schedule if you don't want appeals to have fees um, I think the easiest way to do that would be just to not have a, a charge for appeals we don't hear that many of them um, and that would allow for equal treatment of anybody who wanted to have appeals um, but they, they, it's $1,900 to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. 
Uh, and, and that's just because of the process involved. We have verbatim transcripts done at the Planning Commission meeting that goes to the board. The board has to determine whether the Planning Commission erred in its decision, so we have to create a whole record for the board. If the board finds um, and they make a decision and someone wants to appeal the board's decision, then it goes to circuit court. So we have to make sure all the documentation's in place, and we, we treat it as an official big deal. Um, as far as uh, resources in the in, um, Planning Commission shifting, you know, if they, they go to a stipend, we can certainly include that in our budget. Um, the Board of Zoning Appeals makes a whopping $15 a day, uh, <laughs> as prescribed by state law. There's no requirement by state law that the Planning Commission gets paid, but there is but for the Board of Zoning Appeals, actually. So um, we, we can certainly look at that. There are consequences uh, to shifting to night meetings from a, from a staff capacity standpoint. And, and um, how we do our work because I mean and I can I probably not for this discussion but I can lay that out in a memo to you if you would like just so you can understand kind of the trade-offs um, because uh, planners are actually GREIU uh, members and so not APA and so the work rules to associate with GREIU and the daytime impacts it would have to service levels in the development center for counter work and phone calls uh, given the volume that we deal with, there are some offsets that we have to take into consideration. Mayor. City Manager. Can I suggest to help move this forward um, because there are going to continue to be applicants and continue to be decisions made that um, Suzanne has started to show you and Commissioner uh, Kelly I think put us on a track that how about Suzanne come back and recommend to you a series of um, restrictions or parameters that would be put on any applicants um, assuming that they follow all of the rules of these things things that the Commission was suggesting that are listed in Suzanne's book then in, they could be administratively approved I, I truly believe the the problem that you're having you will continue to have forevermore when you have an objective decision on a liquor license as defined by l law but you can deny on a subjective basis like deterioration of a neighborhood. I think you need to make the criteria very clear. Three square feet, two doors, you can only sell till midnight, you can only sell these products, whatever, it, you can't, you, you said the problem with the one in Boston Squares, there's two right next door. You can't have one if there's another one within a half mile. You can do that here. Those are the kind of rules I would suggest if you pass those, maybe it'll make neighborhoods feel more comfortable that there is some control over this because to continually tell the neighbors you have to argue under detriment whether you think it's clear or not it's an uphill battle and it's subjective and you're asking your planning commissioners to make a judgment on whether that's true or not where if it's three square feet sell till midnight those things are very clear and meanwhile then do we want, do you all want me to put a motion on the table for a moratorium until we figure it out? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a choice in that. That was for them. <laughs> and Commissioner Allen. Well, just it, for, for the sake of, for the sake of just practicality, I looked at the next, there's only one more planning commission meeting. It's December 9th. There's not one application on that, on that meeting. For, uh, I'm looking, where's Chris? For not, no, there's two? For alcohol. For alcohol. Well, on the, on the uh, agenda. Not, not in the context that we're talking about at a neighborhood level. It's on 28th Street and it's package sales, which is a different than a neighbor, a gas station, at least from my perspective. There's one party store on 28th Street and there's one on Burton Street that is gas station. Okay, the, then, then we do need to have this resolved before December 9th. Burton and <laughs> so, what? Southwest three 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 hundred block. I thought the meeting was December fourteenth. Is it the ninth? Just, just I thought it was the ninth. Maybe it's the fourteenth. I think it's so. I, th I thought we, we have one more meeting. We, we had my point, meeting. My point that I wanted to make is we have one more meeting before the next planning before commission. Before the next planning commission yes. <laughs> meeting. The the only way if you wanted to I and mean, that's where I think your discussion about whether or not. I don't want to say the M word, but if you wanted to do that, <laughs> that would that would that's the only thing that would stop the planning commission from being able to make a decision in December. Otherwise, can those, can those two requests not be moved at January? No. Okay. 
they've, they've submitted their application. They have the right to be heard. The, I mean, the only the only thing that would stop it would be the moratorium. Um, if you were to recommend a um, approval, if you wanted to see zoning changes that then standardize things, um, it would go to the planning commission first for a public hearing, and then they would make a recommendation and it would come back to you, which is about a two month process between notifications. Yes, that's not going to be done before they meet. No. I still go back to it seems very clear to me that there's a way to make the case under special land use under the rules that we already have in place we do special land use where in one neighborhood it may be denied and another neighborhood it may be approved based on that neighborhood so I guess that's where I'm struggling is that to me there's a process in place for the neighbors to weigh in and make the case and be heard and as Commissioner Jones said you know the expectation should be that those voices should be heard and 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 at least uh, be a part of the decision. Well, and I think that way, or at least impact the decision. I mean, that's that's actually why I love planning because you can argue both ways on this stuff. I think it's fascinating, and I think that quite, you know the city commission is in charge of appointments, and we will work with the planning commission on more training. Um, and so ultimately, though, it's kind of who's deciding and and how does that happen and I think um, the standards I agree I think they are subjective and, and they are they are useful to get those nuances of different neighborhoods um, because it does depend on where you're at in the location so it's just kind of trying to make the whole system work better and whether it's it's putting different rules in so there's greater consistency and clarity and what the expectations are or if it's you know if, if it's just more training for the Planning Commission. So, uh, Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, I just, um, I, I share your frustrations, but I think, again, that we can get to some of that detail by having staff go back and look at this and make some recommendations, like Greg said. Yeah. And I would like to get some kind of a cost estimate on training, too, both for the Planning Commission and maybe putting together some videos for the the neighbors who are going to have to come before a planning commission to understand the process, the standards, and and how best to approach the commission. Okay. Because I really, I really think I don't even know if I'm allowed to speak because this is still technical. <laughs> Mr. Elect, you are welcome to speak. <laughs> but you know, John is right. Business people want certainty so they can make a business plan, so they can make money, and they can evaluate their decision about that. But the community wants some some level of certainty too. Okay. That if something doesn't look like what they want in their neighborhood, that they have some level of recourse, but it can't be subjective. So we want to provide certainty on both sides. Right now, the community doesn't feel like it has any certainty, and I think that the business community is also looking for certainty for that to be spelled out. So I think that's, that certainty is a good word. Um, but right now, the community doesn't feel like it has, it feels like if they they don't know when they show up, what's going to happen. Right. Uh, and, that, and that's where the disconnect is from the community standpoint. Yeah. Right. Which I think is consistent with what we heard from neighbors, is that I bought this house, and this was not a use at the time, and now mm -hmm. you're saying that it is. I was just going to affirm what Greg said and Commissioner um, Kelly that we make some changes to our <coughs> policies and standards because we have to keep in mind that um, there's two stakeholders here. There's the neighborhoods, but there's also the business owners, mm -hmm. and so part of what we do is balance for the best interests of both. And so when you go to those hearings, um, what the Planning Commission does, they take all of the factors and we put out there, here's the requirements for you to get this. And then we go through and we check each of those little boxes to see if they meet the requirements. So if they meet that threshold, then we're prepared to then give them a license. Okay, citizens can come in and they can say, well, no, we don't want this in our neighborhood because of X, Y, and Z. It's not enough just to say it. You have to be able to back it up, which does put an extra burden on the citizens. But it's just like going to court. You go to court and you say X, and the judge wants to know, well, where, where do you have to support X? And so this is the same scenario. They have to meet, at least convince the planning commission that these things um, are the detriment. What is that detriment, and how do you support that? You can't punish the business for a future crime. You have to be able to tie in some data that shows them that that does have that effect on their their neighborhoods. Data related to the land, not to the Correct. operator. Correct. 
Right. Correct. And, and, and we've also, I mean, for the two applications in the pipeline, they've applied under what is our standard that we all have right here. Uh -huh. um, and so the idea that we can put a moratorium in place and uh, then change the standard when they've already made an application is changing the rules of the game right. mid-course, and that's a dangerous precedent. Commissioner Allen, did you have something to add? I see you were chatting. Yeah, I just had to get clarification. I'm, I'm looking at the Planning Commission meeting, and I don't see what Landon told me, but Landon said that this is not the full agenda. There are a lot of gas station applications on the next meeting, um, quite a few, actually. I'm sorry, there the, the, uh, I thought you said there were two. The web portal, there's, there's one gas station. There are about seven or eight items total. Oh, got and it. So those aren't showing up on the web portal. Right there is one gas station today. application. Yeah. Got it. One gas station. Well, it, but when I'm looking at this, last thought, and then we'll try to move on here because I see we're running over. Uh, but I'm looking at these review standards, and I, I think we can do some of this legwork. I mean, you can show a map to show proximity to parks and religious institutions and schools. You can easily pull up crime data to look at, at the, the crime data. I mean, some of these I, I, I actually think... Yes, they're somewhat subjective, but they're they're. But mayor, how about fifty feet from a school as opposed to proximity to a school? If we make things mm -hmm. crystal clear, then there will be certainty on both sides. But right There's now, we're having very subjective. And here's the difficulty, mayor: it's not, it's not the clarity of the law. It's the burden you're placing on neighbors. You're placing a very high burden on neighbors that they have to show a proof of detriment. I think it would be much easier for neighbors if they all they had to prove is you have too many square feet, you have too many doors, you're operating too late. Whatever it is, then neighbors can make those arguments. Okay, so next steps on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, appointments committee, we will review uh, planning commission. I know we're already in conversations about that. Uh, city manager, your recommendation was to have the planning department or Suzanne or a subcommittee get together and talk about this? What's your We'll do a subcommittee that met earlier to bring you this, um, which includes Suzanne in the law department, planning department, law department, and we'll come forward with some standard recommendations for you so that you can consider, and if you like them, we can put them into play as soon as possible. For the review standards, the process to amend the review standards, is that different? Walk us through that process. I would not recommend changing the review standards because they're they're court tested. I mean, there's a whole bunch of case law and there's certain specifications in law about the, the standards. So I would not recommend the standards. In fact, the, the fact that we added these alcohol sales review standards, this was, this was added in response. There was actually concerns about Bridge Street. And when we redid the zoning ordinance in 2007, um, um, I think this was actually done in 2010, but the alcohol sales review standards were specifically added um, in recognition of that. So I think we have those portions covered. I think the distinction that the manager is trying to make is, are there things that we want to be more prescriptive with um, in the zoning ordinance, almost performance standards, where we could see different levels of approval? Um, is, is that where you were getting at, Greg? That we would we could handle things differently. If it's this threshold, it's minor. If it's this threshold, it's major, and it requires additional additional considerations. Yes. We also we also provided an uh, example in the back of this document um, of a good neighbor plan that is done in the city of Sarasota, Florida. Uh, Courtney and my staff came from Sarasota, and this was something that they used to build a relationship between the business owner and the neighborhood, and set those expectations for kind of management. We do require a management plan as part of alcohol approvals now. That's something that was not done uh, years ago, but we do require that, and we require that the operator work with the vice unit to make sure that they're complying. Uh, and we do um, have requirements in the zoning ordinance regarding crime prevention through environmental design for viewing windows. But um, in, in some cases where we've heard neighborhood concern, we've actually had them do a septed review of the building itself, and that could be more formalized as well. Okay. So um, we have another meeting before the Planning Commission meets. Yes. So can we add this to agenda and between then and between now and then, yes. can you all meet and bring back some recommendations that we can then review and discuss and yes, we will. There'll forward. be in bite sizes. Um, may I have one? Yeah. I have one question. I don't know whether this is possible, but I'm certainly thinking about our smaller stores, you know, your quick stop kind of convenience stores and that ratio of food 
to alcohol and if there's anything we can do around that I'd just be interested to know. Yeah, we can certainly work with the Kent County Health Department and see what they've been working on on corner stores in general. I mean, the, I think that I did put that in the memo because the concern we've had, they've had specifically about corner stores, not gas stations, because that's new, um, has been the excuse was, well, we don't have any room because our store is so small for fresh, healthy food. But then, you know, you could have displacement for alcohol. So that's, I think that's the, that's the concern that they would have. And so I can talk to them and see if there's a ratio. Okay. But, and okay. don't, but don't rule Fun out. I mean, food is not the only option. I mean, think of a store like Sicilianos, mm-hmm. who's they don't really sell a lot of food. They sell beer and wine, and but they also sell stuff to make beer and wine. They sell stuff to make bread. They sell honey. They sell other things mm-hmm. that aren't necessarily food components. Okay. But it's not just a liquor right. store. Okay. No, so that's a good point. Again, don't rob restaurants. Be careful. Yeah. Right.